Shadows of the Workhouse by Jennifer Worth Read by Anne Reed. Nanata's house was both a convent and the working base for the nursing and midwifery services of the sisters of St. Raymond Nanatus. The sisters, bound for life by monastic vows of poverty, chastity and obedience, had been working in the heart of London Docklands since the 1870s. The practice covered Poplar, the Isle of Dogs, Stepney, Limehouse, Millwall, Bow, Mile End and parts of Whitechapel. I worked with the sisters in the 1950s, when the scars of the Second World War could be seen everywhere. Bomb sites, blown-out shops, closed streets and roofless houses, often inhabited. It was a time when the docks were fully operational, and millions of tons of cargo poured in and out every day. Huge merchant vessels sailed up the Thames, to be piloted into the wharves through a complex system of canals, locks and basins. It was not unusual to pass along a road within a few feet of the towering hulk of a merchant ship. Even in the 1950s, about 60% of all cargo was unloaded manually, and the ports teemed with labourers. Most of them lived with their families in the little houses and tenements around the docks. Families were large, sometimes huge. Ten babies was quite common, and living conditions cramped. Most dwellings had running cold water, but no hot water. About half had an indoor lavatory, but for the other half the lavatory was outside, usually shared with other families. Very few homes had a bathroom. Most houses had electric light, but gaslight was still common, and I have delivered many a baby by this flickering light, as well as by torchlight or hurricane lamp. Convents tend to attract ladies of middle years who are single, widowed or divorced, and lonely. They're nearly always gentle, timid and shy, with an immense yearning for the goodness which they see in the convent, but cannot find in the harsh world outside. Usually they're very devout in religious observance, and have a romanticised idea of monastic life, and long to be part of it. However, they often do not have a true vocation that would enable them to take the life vows of poverty, chastity and obedience. Nor, I suspect, would they possess the strength of character necessary to live within these vows. So they hover on the fringe, neither fully within the world nor withdrawn from it. Such a lady was Jane. She was probably around 45 when I met her, but she looked much older. She was tall, thin, aristocratic in appearance, with delicate bone structure, beautifully sculpted features, and refined manners. In another context, she would have been an outstanding beauty, but her excessive dowdiness made her look plain and nondescript. Her grey hair could have curled prettily around her face, but she cut it herself, so it was jagged and shapeless. Her height should have rendered her distinguished, but her carriage and walk were stooped and cringing. Her large, expressive eyes were filled with nameless anxiety and surrounded by worry lines. Her speech was so soft it sounded like a far-off twitter, and her laugh a nervous giggle. In fact, nervousness was her chief characteristic. She seemed frightened of everything. I noticed that even at meals she did not dare to pick up her knife and fork until everyone else had done so. And when she did, her hands frequently shook so much that she would drop something. And then she had to apologise profusely to everyone, especially to Sister Julienne, who was always at the head of the table. Jane had lived at Nanata's house for many years, and fulfilled a role that was a mixture of nurse and domestic servant. I had the impression that she was a highly intelligent woman who could easily have trained as a nurse, if not for her chronic nervousness. So Sister Julienne sent her out to do simple jobs, like blanket baths or enemas or delivering things to patients. In doing these jobs, Jane was all of a twitter with anxiety going over and over her bag obsessively, muttering to herself, Have I got everything? Is it all there? 
Consequently, it took her two or three hours to do a job that any competent nurse could have achieved in twenty minutes. When she had finished, she was pathetically eager for recognition, her eyes almost pleading for someone to say that she'd done well. Sister Julienne always praised her small achievements, but I could see that it was a strain for her to be so constantly alert to Jane's craving for praise. Jane also helped the nurses and midwives in the clinical room in small ways, such as cleaning instruments, packing bags and so on, and again she was irritatingly eager to please. Asked for a syringe, she would rush off and get three. Asked for some cotton wool swabs for one baby, she would bring enough for twenty, and then almost grovel as she handed over the item with a nervous giggle. This crave and urge to please brought her no rest, no comfort. It was all very disconcerting, especially as she was old enough to be my mother, and as it generally took her about three times as long as it took me to do a job, I refrained from asking. But she intrigued me, and I watched her. Jane spent most of her time in the house, so one of her jobs was to take telephone messages, which she did with meticulous and needless over-attention to detail. She also helped Mrs. B in the kitchen. This led to many a rumpus, because Mrs. B was a quick and efficient cook, and Jane's dithering nearly drove her to distraction. She shouted at Jane to put a move on, and then poor Jane would be paralysed with terror, and she'd just stand stock still, whimpering. Once I heard Mrs. B tell Jane to peel the potatoes and cut them in half for roasting. Later, she found that Jane had cut every potato into about twenty pieces. She'd been so desperately anxious to please by cutting them into exact halves that she couldn't stop, and every half had been cut in half again, and so on, until all that was left was a mound of tiny pieces. When Mrs. B exploded, Jane fell back against the wall, pleading for forgiveness, shaking and white with terror. Fortunately, Sister Julienne came into the kitchen at that moment, saw the situation, and rescued Jane. Never mind, Mrs. B, we'll have mash today. They're just the right size for steaming. Jane, come with me, will you please? The laundry has just come back and needs checking. Poor Jane's eyes said it all. Her fears, her grief, her gratitude, and her love. I watched her go and wondered what had happened to make her so fragile. She was very devout and attended Mass every day. She also attended most of the five monastic offices of the nuns. I had seen her in the chapel, her fingers counting her rosary, her eyes earnestly fixed on the altar, half intoning the words, Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, over and over again, a hundred times or more. It is easy to scoff at such devotion. Women like Jane can be seen everywhere, and they are always fair game for a cheap laugh. If to all appearances Jane was a bit of a dimwit, her reading gave me the clue that she was, in fact, exactly the opposite. She was a voracious, almost obsessive reader. Books were her only self-indulgence, and I took to spying on her authors. Flaubert, Dostoevsky, Russell, Kierkegaard. I was astonished. Predictably, she had a daily discipline of Bible reading. But beyond the Old and New Testaments, her devotional reading was formidable. St. Thomas Aquinas, Augustine, St. John of the Cross. I looked at her with new eyes. Aquinas for recreation. This was no dimwit. I discovered that Jane had spent twenty years in domestic service. She had been put into service at the age of fourteen, when life for a servant girl was very hard indeed. She had to be up about four a.m. to fetch the wood and coal, clear the grates and light the fires. Then it would be a day of constant heavy work, at the beck and call of the mistress of the house, until ten or eleven at night, when she would finally be allowed to go to bed. Jane had been hopeless at the job of simple housework, so she was continually getting the sack and having to find another position. Few domestic servants can have been less suited to the job than Jane. Her incompetence was monumental. Poor Jane. 
I once saw her trying to light a gas mantle. It took her 40 minutes. First she spilled the matches, and by the end she had broken the mantle, broken the glass shade, cut herself, set fire to a tea towel, and scorched the wallpaper. No wonder she was always getting the sack. I remember an occasion at Anata's house when Jane spilled a drop of milk on the floor. She trembled and whimpered. I'll clean it up. I'll clean it up. I'll do it. She then proceeded to wash the entire kitchen floor, including moving all the tables and chairs. No one could stop her. I asked Sister Julienne why she behaved in this way. Jane was utterly crushed as a child, explained Sister. She will never get over it. Jane very seldom went out and never left Nanata's house for a night. The only person she was ever known to visit was Peggy, who lived on the Isle of Dogs with her brother, Frank. No one could describe Peggy as plump. Voluptuous would be a better description. Her softly rounded curves spoke eloquently of ease and comfort. Her large grey eyes, fringed with dark curling lashes, had a sensuous quality in their dreamy depths. Her smooth, clear skin glowed with radiance, and every time she smiled, which was often, dimples enhanced her beauty. Allure might well have been her middle name. Yet Peggy was not an idle lady of leisure. Peggy was a charwoman. What with office cleaning in the early hours of the morning, her ladies in Bloomsbury and Knightsbridge, and restaurants and banks each afternoon, she was always busy. Peggy cleaned at Nanata's house three mornings a week, and the house always smelled sweetly of wax polish and carbolic soap when she left. Everyone liked her. Her beauty was refreshing, and her smile raised the spirits. Furthermore, she sang quietly to herself as she polished and scrubbed. She had a pretty voice, and sang the old-fashioned folk songs and hymns that children used to learn in schools and Sunday schools. It was a delight to listen to her. She was kind to everyone, and never seemed to get ruffled. Peggy was a good deal older than she looked. Her beautiful skin, in which the only wrinkles were laughter lines around her eyes, made her look about thirty, but in fact she too was approaching forty-five. Her supple body was as agile as that of a young girl, and she was graceful in all her movements. Although they were around the same age, Peggy looked at least twenty years younger than Jane. Her curves contrasted with Jane's stiff, angular bones, her clear, youthful skin with the other's dried-out wrinkles, her pretty blonde hair with Jane's ill-cut greyness. Her easy-going laughter was infectious, while Jane's nervous giggle was irritating. Yet Peggy treated Jane with great tenderness, often making her laugh in a way that no one else could. Jane seemed more relaxed when Peggy was in the house. She smiled more readily and seemed, if possible, less apprehensive. Peggy's brother, Frank, was a fishmonger, known to all as Frank the Fish. By common consent, he kept the best wet fish stall in Crisp Street Market. His success was due to three things. The excellence of his fish, the ebullience of his personality, and his commitment to hard work. He slept little and rose about three o'clock each morning to go to Billingsgate Fish Market. He had to push his barrow along the quiet streets, as very few working men had a van in those days. At Billingsgate, he personally selected all his fish, and he was back at Crisp Street by 8 a.m. to set up his stall. He was an effervescent bundle of energy, and he loved his work. He brought fun and laughter to hundreds of people, and many dockers were served kippers for tea simply because their good wives couldn't resist the bantering flirtation that fell from his lips. He shut up the stall at 2 p.m. every day, and started on his delivery round. He called at Nanata's house twice every week, and he and Mrs. B, who was not a great admirer of men, were best of friends. Frank seemed an unlikely friend for Jane, who was pathologically shy of men. If the plumber or the baker called at the house and Jane opened the door, she would go to pieces. She would chirrup and twitter around them, trying to be pleasant, 
but merely succeeding in being ridiculous. But with Frank she was different. His ready banter and cockney wit were tempered by gentleness and consideration, to which Jane responded with a shy, sweet smile and eyes filled with gratitude. Once after Jane had been to visit Peggy and Frank, she said wistfully, If only I had a brother, I would be happy if I had a brother. It was only later that I learnt the sad stories that brought these three people together. Jane, Peggy and Frank had been brought up in the workhouse. Jane and Peggy had become best friends and shared everything. They had slept in adjacent beds in a dormitory of 70 girls. They had sat next to each other in the refectory, where meals for 300 girls were taken. They had gone to the same school. They had shared the same household chores. Above all, they had shared each other's thoughts and feelings and sufferings, as well as their small joys. Today, workhouses may seem like a distant memory, but for children such as Jane, Peggy and Frank, the impact of having spent their formative years in such an institution was almost unimaginable. My own generation grew up in the shadow of the workhouse. Our parents and grandparents lived in constant fear that something unpredictable would happen and they would end up in one of those terrible buildings. An accident or illness or unemployment could mean loss of wages, then eviction and homelessness. An illegitimate pregnancy or the death of parents or old age could lead to destitution. And for many, the dreaded workhouse became a reality. In medieval times, convents and monasteries gave succour to the poor and needy as part of their Christian duty. But in England, Henry VIII's dissolution of the monasteries put a stop to that in the 1530s. Queen Elizabeth I passed the Act for the Relief of the Poor in 1601, the aim being to make provision for those who could not support themselves because of age or disability. Each parish in England was encouraged to set aside a small dwelling for the shelter of the destitute. These were known as poorhouses. It was a remarkable act of an enlightened queen and crystallised the assumption that the state was responsible for the poorest of the poor. The 1601 Act continued in force for over 200 years and was adequate for a rural population of around 5 to 10 million souls. But the Industrial Revolution, which gathered pace in the latter part of the 18th century, changed society forever. One of the most remarkable features of the 19th century was the population explosion. In 1801, the population of England, Wales and Scotland was around 10.5 million. By 1851, it had doubled to 20 million. And by 1901, it had doubled again to 45 million. Government could not cope with this fourfold increase of population in 100 years. With the huge numbers of people in the cities, overcrowding, poverty, hunger and destitution increased exponentially and the Poor Law Act of 1601 was inadequate. A royal commission was set up and in 1834 the Poor Law Amendment Act was passed. Responsibility for the relief of destitution was removed from individual parishes and handed over to unions of parishes. The small parish poorhouses were closed, and the unions were required to provide large houses, each designed to accommodate several hundred people. The aim was that the poor shall be set to work and they shall dwell in working houses. And so the union workhouses were born. Each was to be run by a master and his wife, together with a number of paid officers who assisted them. Overall responsibility for each workhouse was in the hands of a local board of guardians and they were financed partly by the local poor law rates and partly through government loans that had to be repaid. Running costs were to be met by local rates but income could also be generated through the work of the inmates. It can be argued that the workhouse system was the first attempt at social welfare in this country. 
Certainly it was intended as a safety net to house and feed the very poorest of society, and it laid the foundations of our modern welfare state. Yet the implementation of the high ideals of the reformers and legislators went tragically wrong, and the workhouses came to be dreaded as places of shame, suffering and despair. People would often rather have died than go there, and some did. My grandfather knew a man who hanged himself when the guardians informed him that he must go into the workhouse. Most of the labouring poor lived on a perpetual knife edge between subsistence and destitution. For them, the workhouse represented not a safety net, but a dark and fearsome abyss, from which, should they fall, there would be no escape. The authors of the 1834 Act proposed separate workhouses for different categories of paupers, but within a year or two, economy and ease of management dictated that mixed workhouses became the norm. These were built to house all groups of paupers, the old, the sick, the chronically infirm, children, the mentally disabled, as well as able-bodied men and women who were unemployed and therefore destitute. However, such great diversity of people under one roof and one administration was doomed to failure. The original policy was that the workhouse should be a place of last resort, therefore that conditions inside a workhouse should be less comfortable than a state of homeless destitution outside. Strict rules for admission were intended to deter the idle and shiftless from seeking admission, but the result, in a mixed workhouse, was that all classes of paupers suffered, Nobody could come up with an answer to the question of how to deter the idle without penalising the defenceless. In order that the workhouse really should be a place of last resort, a rigid, inflexible system of discipline and punishment was introduced. Families were separated, men from women, husbands from wives, and brothers from sisters. Children over seven were taken away from their mothers. The official policy was that babies and children under seven could stay with their mothers in the women's quarters, but policy and practice often diverge, and mothers and toddlers were frequently separated. The construction of the buildings was such that there was no access from one group of paupers to another. Heating was minimal, even in the depths of winter. People had to sleep in dormitories in which anything up to 70 paupers could be accommodated. For each, an iron bedstead, a straw palliasse and a blanket were provided. Inadequate protection against the cold winters. Paupers were locked into the dormitory each night and the sanitary arrangements were disgusting. A coarse, rough uniform often made of hemp which was very harsh on the skin and offered no real warmth in the winter, was provided. Pauper's heads were sometimes shaved. Regulations permitted the hair of children to be forcibly shaved. This was intended for the control of lice or fleas, but was sometimes done as a punishment, especially on little girls, for whom it was a humiliation. Food was minimal, and meals frequently had to be eaten in silence, the paupers sitting in serried rows. The quantity of food for a workhouse pauper in the middle of the 19th century was less than that provided for a prisoner in jail, although this improved towards the end of the century. Paupers were only allowed to go outside the workhouse walls with the permission of the master to look for work or for special reasons, such as attending a baptism, funeral or wedding. In theory, paupers could discharge themselves from the workhouse, but in practice this seldom happened because of their abject poverty and the limitations of available work. All these rules, and many more, had to be obeyed on pain of harsh punishments, which included flogging, birching, withholding food and solitary confinement. Complaints about daily living conditions were usually dealt with by punishment. Deference to the master, his wife and the officers was required at all times. These evils had been designed to deter the indolent from entering the workhouse. The tragedy was that the rules, regulations and punishments applied universally, with the result that old people, 
the sick, the crippled, the mentally disabled and children suffered dreadfully. The atmosphere inside a workhouse was not only stifling to the human soul, but destroyed the last shreds of human dignity. Another great problem that led to the ill repute of the workhouses was the staff. In the early years, none of them had any training because there was no precedent. But the unfortunate result was that it opened the floodgates to all sorts of petty dictators who enjoyed wielding power. The masters had unlimited authority, and their character determined the lives of the paupers, for good or ill. Rules had to be obeyed, and the master could be harsh and tyrannical. The deterrent rules ensured that the only qualification required of applicants for the posts of workhouse master and officers was the ability to enforce discipline. Many came from the armed forces, reflecting the controlling and disciplinary role that was expected of them. The work aspect of the system rapidly became an acute and intractable problem. The sale of goods was not the primary purpose of the Poor Law Act but to generate some income for the workhouse, items and produce made by the paupers were sold in the open market. This led to protests from employers in the private sector on two counts. Firstly, that the goods produced in the workhouse by cheap labour would seriously undercut them. Secondly, that the resulting loss of business would affect their employees, who would either have to accept reduced wages or even lose their jobs. So pointless, profitless work was introduced to keep the paupers busy. For example, stone-breaking was required of the men. Industrial England could break stones using machinery, but the paupers had to break granite with a mallet. Animal bones could be ground into powder for fertilizer by machine, but paupers had to grind bones by hand. In one workhouse there was a corn mill for men to push round and round, for hours on end, but it had no function. It was grinding nothing. The women did all the cooking and laundry for their fellow inmates. Scrubbing vast lengths of stone floors, corridors and stairs was a daily requirement. Sewing sails for sailing boats by hand and picking oakum for caulking ships were further tasks that fell to the women and children. Oakum was old rope, frequently impregnated with tar or sea salt, which had to be unpicked by hand and tore the skin and nails. The fibres were then used for filling in the cracks between the wooden planks of ships. The 1834 Poor Law Act required elementary education for children three hours per day, and a schoolmaster was employed by each board of guardians. When the Education Act of 1870 was passed, Children were removed from the mixed workhouses and placed in separate establishments and had to attend the local board school. Under the 1834 Act, a qualified medical officer was required to attend the sick, but nursing was carried out by untrained female inmates. In large groups of enclosed people who were not allowed out, infectious diseases spread like wildfire. For example, in the 1880s in a workhouse in Kent, it was found that in a child population of 154, only three children did not have tuberculosis. One hears about the insane crowded into workhouses. I think workhouse life bred and fostered its own insanity. I once heard in the 1950s what used to be called the workhouse howl, emitted from the throat of a woman who had been a workhouse inmate for twenty years. It was a noise to make your blood run cold. Medical infirmaries were also available for the hospital treatment of the poor, who could not afford to pay a doctor or to go to hospital. But the infirmaries came to be feared almost as much as the workhouses themselves, and were regarded as places of disease, insanity, neglect and death. Medical and nursing staff were of the lowest order and were frequently brutal and ignorant. It was work which no doctor who valued his career would undertake. The attitudes of the medical and nursing staff who were careless of the lives of paupers reflected the mores of the time. 
The stigma of illegitimacy has destroyed the lives of millions of unfortunate young women and blighted those of their children. If a girl's lover deserted her, and her parents could not or would not support her and the child, the workhouse was often the only form of relief available. The baby would be born in the infirmary. After weaning, the girl would be encouraged to leave the workhouse with her baby to seek employment, but this was usually impossible to find because of the limited labour market for women, further restricted because of the presence of a baby. The girl would also be encouraged to give her baby up for adoption. Many girls were medically certified as hysterical or of unsound mind or even morally degenerate and the baby forcibly removed and brought up in the workhouse. The young mother would be expected to leave, find work outside and contribute to the poor rates to offset the cost of keeping and educating the child. If she could not find work, she would have to return to the women's section of the workhouse. The system was heartless and stupid, but those were the rules, and they reflected the social attitude that a fallen woman should be punished. It was such a story that brought Jane to the workhouse when her mother was dismissed for an illicit liaison with her employer. We'll have to watch that one, saucy little madam. Did you hear the way she spoke out of turn at breakfast? Oh, don't you worry, my dear, I'll break her before she leaves here. The master and mistress were talking about Jane, who had been in the workhouse since birth. It was rumoured that her father was a high-class gentleman, distinguished in Parliament and at the bar. When his wife found him in bed with a servant girl, the girl was immediately dismissed and went to the workhouse, where Jane was born. The baby stayed with her mother to be breastfed, but was then taken to the infant's nursery. The mother returned to the women's section and never saw her baby again. Thus Jane was entirely reared by the institution and knew no other life. It was a harsh, repressive existence, but no amount of smacks or punishments could subdue Jane's bubbling laughter and joie de vivre. In the playground, she chased the other children. In the dormitory, she crept under the beds and poked the mattresses of sleeping children with a stick. Her behaviour caused uproar, and an officer would run in with smacks and orders to be quiet. But Jane giggled and did it again. As she grew, her high spirits got her into endless trouble. Docility and obedience were expected from the children, and if there was any deviation from this, naughty little Jane could generally be found at the centre of it. Who was it that tied Officer Sharp's shoelaces together as she sat darning socks so that she fell over when she stood up and took a step? No one knew, but as Jane had been seen in the vicinity, she got a good smacking for it. Who was it that climbed the drain pipe in the playground? Why, Jane, of course. And who mixed up all the boots in the dormitory so everyone had the wrong sizes? If it wasn't Jane, it might as well have been. She got the punishment. Jane's great misfortune was that she stood out. In a group of children, she could not be overlooked. She was a good deal taller than average and also prettier, with her dark curls and clear blue eyes. She was also a great deal more intelligent than most of the other children, and the master and mistress feared an intelligent child. They told the officers to keep an eye on her. Keep in line. Don't straggle. Heads up now. Don't slouch. The girls were marching to church one Sunday morning. It was a very long crocodile consisting of nearly 100 girls. Jane watched fat old Officer Hawkins strutting along like a penguin and with an instinctive gift for mimicry, she copied the walk, head thrown back, arms flapping, feet splayed. The girls behind started to giggle, and a hand hit Jane on the head with such force that she fell through the column of girls onto the road. She was hauled up and hit again, and then pushed back into line. Her ears were ringing, and lights were darting before her eyes, but she had to keep marching. She was six years old. Where did it come from? 
demanded the master, his eyes bulging, his face turning red. Who is guilty of this insolence? He was looking at a sketch of himself on a page torn from an exercise book. It was a remarkable drawing for a child, but all the master could see was himself with an exaggerated moustache, a square head, small eyes, and an exceedingly large stomach. The picture had been circulating among the girls, causing endless amusement, which only added to the master's fury. He assembled all the girls in the hall and addressed them from the pulpit. He reminded them that they were paupers who must respect and obey their betters. No act of disobedience, disrespect or insubordination would be tolerated. He held up the pencil drawing. Who did this? he demanded menacingly. No one moved. Very well. Every single girl in this room will be beaten, starting now with the first row. Jane stood up. I did it, sir, she whispered. She was taken to the discipline room, a small square room with no windows and no furniture except for one stool. Around the wall hung several canes and a leather-thonged whip, which had three tails with a small lead pellet attached to the end of each tail. Jane was beaten severely with a cane on her bare bottom. She could not sit down for several days. She was only seven years old. That should be enough to break her spirit, thought the master to himself with satisfaction. But it wasn't. He couldn't understand it. Why, the very next morning he'd seen her dancing across the playground as though she hadn't a care in the world. The reason why Jane's spirit was not broken was that she had her own special secret, and she had told no one except Peggy. She locked it in her heart and hugged it to herself. It was this glorious secret that filled her with such irrepressible joy and exhilaration. The rumour that her father was a high-born gentleman in Parliament had reached Jane's ears when she was a little girl. But to Jane, it was not a rumour. It was an absolute fact. Her daddy was a high-born gentleman, who one day would come and take her away. She fantasised endlessly about her daddy. She had a very clear picture of him in her mind. He was not like any other man she had seen at the workhouse, not like the coal man, nor the baker, nor the boiler man. They were ugly and short and wore rough working men's clothing and cloth caps. He was not like the master or any of the officers. Jane's little nose wrinkled with disgust at the thought. Her daddy was tall and slim with fine features and pale skin. He had long fingers. She looked at her own slender hands and knew that she had inherited her daddy's fingers. He had lots of hair, and it was a soft grey colour, always clean and nicely brushed. He always wore beautiful suits smelling of lavender, and he wore a top hat and carried a walking cane with a gold crest on top. She knew just what his voice sounded like also. After all, he was constantly talking to her. It was musical and deep and full of laughter. She knew this because he was always laughing with her and making fun of the master and the officers. His eyes had twinkled with amusement and he had called her his clever girl when she had drawn a funny picture of the master. So how could Jane be unhappy? The more they beat her, the closer she drew to her daddy. He comforted her when she cried at night. He dried her tears and told her to be a brave girl. She swallowed her tears quickly, because she knew he liked to see her smiling and happy, and she made up a funny story to amuse him, because she knew he liked her funny stories. Her daddy took her by the hand and told her that one day he would come and take her away from the workhouse, and they would live together in a beautiful home. Jane was seven years old when she began to attend the local council school. It was a proper school for big girls, and Jane loved it. It brought her into contact with a life outside the workhouse. 
It also introduced her to learning, which she loved, and her young mind began to expand. Excellent reports of her progress were sent back to the workhouse. The master was not impressed. A request from the school's headmistress for Jane to be allowed to take piano lessons, as she showed an unusually good ear for music, was refused. The master saying that no workhouse pauper should be singled out for special treatment. A request that Jane should be allowed to take the role of Mary in the school's nativity play was refused for the same reason. Jane was fortunate in her class teacher. Miss Sutton was young, well-educated, and possessed a missionary zeal for teaching the poorest of the poor. She saw in the vivacious Jane unusual qualities that she was determined to promote. The child learnt to read and write in about a quarter of the time it took the other children. So, whilst Miss Sutton was engaged with the rest of the class, who were painstakingly spelling out words, she asked Jane to write stories for her. Jane did so with great joy and fluency, picking up any subject Miss Sutton suggested and weaving a delightful child's story around it. Several of these stories were shown to the headmistress, who commented, There is an unusual mind at work here. And she obtained a copy of A Child's Garden of Verse for Jane's use. The child was enraptured by the rhythm of the words and quickly learned many of the poems by heart, which she recited to her daddy when they were alone together. Miss Sutton also introduced Jane to history and geography, using a children's encyclopedia as her textbook. These lessons had to be surreptitious because Miss Sutton was employed to teach reading, writing and arithmetic. Furthermore, she was canny enough to suspect that if she requested extra lessons for Jane, the request would be refused, and that would be the end of history and geography for Jane. Jane adored Miss Sutton, and their lunchtime conversations about kings and queens and faraway places were the high point of her day. The children's encyclopedia was her treasure. There were ten large volumes, each beautifully bound in dark blue, and she pored over each one with a hungry mind. She loved the books. To Jane, they were sacred. Every word she read was, must be, gospel truth, because it was written in the cyclopedia. One day she came across a long word she had not met before. She traced it with her finger and tried to say it to herself. Suddenly it came to her, Parliament. People had said her daddy was in Parliament. She devoured the relevant pages. She didn't understand it all, but that didn't matter. It was about her daddy. Like one possessed, she read on, and then she saw him. The picture leapt towards her. It was her daddy, as she had always known he would look, tall and slim, with grey hair, a thoughtful face, but kindly. He was wearing a beautiful frock coat with tails, slender trousers and elegant shoes. He was carrying a top hat and a walking cane with a gold crest. He had long, slender fingers just like she had. She kissed the page. What is Parliament? she asked Miss Sutton. The Houses of Parliament are where His Majesty's government sits. Where are these houses? Can I go? Will you take me? Miss Sutton laughed. An eager pupil is the breath of life to a dedicated teacher, and she did her best to explain to the seven-year-old that the members of Parliament made the rules that govern the country. Are they very important people and very important rules? The child inquired. Very. There are none higher in the land. More important than the workhouse, master? Oh, much. Members of Parliament are the most important people in the land, after the king. Jane was unable to contain her excitement. She looked up at her teacher, her blue eyes flashing, a smile spreading across her face, as she whispered confidentially, My daddy's in Parliament. Miss Sutton was, to say the least, taken aback. Oh, come now, Jane, that cannot possibly be. 
But he is, he is, it's here in the book. She turned a few pages on and pointed to the artist's impression of a member of Parliament. That's my daddy, I know it is. I've seen him lots and lots of times. But Jane, that is not a real man. That's just a drawing to show the clothes that a member of Parliament might wear. That's not your daddy, dear. It is, it is, I know it is. Jane jumped up. You don't know anything. You don't know my daddy. I do, and I know it's him. And Jane ran from the classroom in tears. Poor Miss Sutton was troubled by this scene and discussed it with the headmistress. They agreed that Jane's reaction was just the longing of a highly imaginative child for a father she had never known. The headmistress advised channeling Jane's thoughts in other directions. That way Jane would forget about it. Alone, Jane had also decided upon a similar course. She would never again mention her father to anyone except Peggy. No one, not even Miss Sutton, was worthy of being let into her secret, and she carried on as though the lunchtime conversation had never occurred. Sir Ian Astor Smalley was a philanthropist, an Oxford man who had devoted most of his life and a considerable part of his fortune to the improvement of living conditions and life expectancy among children in the poorest areas of London. He was a founder member of the Oxford Philanthropic Society for the Improvement of Poor Children, having formed a charity dedicated to the provision of holidays for workhouse children. This work was also close to the heart of his wife, Lady Lavinia. They had made a systematic study of the workhouse system, and though they acknowledged that conditions had improved a great deal since the 1850s, they had seen with their own eyes hundreds of grey, unsmiling children crowded into workhouses and orphanages, and were determined to do something about it. The idea of an annual holiday was Lady Lavinia's. Surely, she argued, two weeks by the sea for unwanted children, with healthy air and sunshine, was not too much to ask of society. The opposition was loud in its scorn. Holidays for pauper children? What next? Let them learn to be grateful that they are given food and shelter. Sir Ian and his lady battled on. When it was proved that one of the causes of rickets was lack of sunlight, they knew that this information could be used to further their cause. Were not many workhouse children afflicted with rickets? And were they not advocating a holiday in the sunshine? Eventually, they won the debate, and the committee passed, by a narrow majority, the resolution that money should be set aside for holidays for the children of one London workhouse. Additional funds were approved for a further five if the experiment proved successful. Suitable premises were found in Kent. These consisted of a series of large barns and sheds that could be adapted as dormitories for the children, who would sleep on straw mattresses on the floor. The sheds were situated in fields that ran down to the sea. To Sir Ian, the site seemed perfect. Sir Ian's next visit was to the workhouse selected for the experiment in order to address the children himself and tell them of their good fortune. He wasn't going to hand over that pleasant task to anyone else, he told his wife. The crocodile of little girls was returning from school. Jane was humming to herself as she marched along, and then her heart stopped beating. The street, the buildings, the very sky itself vanished from her universe. Her daddy was on the other side of the street, walking straight towards the workhouse. She stood stock still. The girls behind piled into her, causing commotion in the line. Get along there, shouted Officer Hawkins, and hit her on the head. Jane neither heard nor felt a thing. Her daddy had turned into the workhouse gate and was walking straight towards the main door. She knew it was him, not a shadow of doubt. He was exactly as she had always known he would look, exactly like the picture in the book. Tall, slim, grey trousers, a frock coat, a top hat, and a walking cane. He had come to take her away, as he had always said he would. 
Joy, unspeakable joy, flooded through Jane. She was almost suffocating with the power of her emotions. She felt that something huge and unknown was inside her, and she was going to burst wide open. Get on there, I told you. Another clout round the head, and Jane ran to catch up with the others. The door had closed behind her daddy, and the girls marched round the back to their usual entrance and stood in line for inspection. Jane didn't stand in line with the others. She rushed straight upstairs to the dormitory, colliding with an officer on the stairway. She was flushed and breathless, but she grabbed the officer's hand, almost shouting, Quick, quick, I must have a clean dress and apron. The officer shook Jane off. Don't be stupid, you have a clean dress on Sunday, not before. The child stamped. But I must, I must, my daddy's downstairs and I want a clean dress and apron before I see him. Your what? My daddy, he's downstairs, he's in the master's office, I saw him go in. There was something so intense, so urgent and compelling about the child that the officer gave in, and Jane was supplied with a clean dress and apron against all the rules. She washed her face and hands, brushed her hair until the curls shone, then flew downstairs to join the other children. The officer plodded downstairs and told her colleagues of the extraordinary scene. They agreed that the child was mad. The girls filed into the hall and sat in rows. Jane fixed her eyes on the door where she knew her daddy would enter. She was burning with expectation. The door opened and Sir Ian walked in, followed by the master. Her heart stopped beating again. It was him. The same grave yet kindly face, the same smooth grey hair and the same deep-set eyes with a smile at the corners. She sat up straight and tall. Her eyes were aflame with love as she smiled. Sir Ian spoke to the children from the pulpit, with the massed young faces staring up at him. He had a joyful message to impart. He had hoped for a joyful response. But most of the girls looked straight ahead, no emotion registering on their features. However, there was one little girl sitting in the middle near the front, who looked really animated. Sir Ian therefore fixed his attention on that person. He said, I'm going to take you away in the summer. The little girl stifled aghast, her eyes alight. He spoke of the countryside and the seaside and said, I'm going to take you to a beautiful place by the sea. The little girl could scarcely contain her emotion as he continued, You'll be able to paddle and swim and build sand castles and collect shells. We'll do all this when the summer comes. The little girl gave a sigh of delight as he stepped down from the pulpit. He felt pleased with himself. Overall, it had been a good address. The girl stood up to leave the hall. One by one, they filed past the master and Sir Ian. It was at this point that Jane lost all control of herself. She rushed out of line and flung her arms around Sir Ian's waist, crying, Thank you, Daddy. Thank you, thank you. Then she burst into tears, sobbing into his waistcoat. He was surprised and not a little touched. He ruffled her pretty hair and murmured, There, there, my child, don't take on so. You'll go to the seaside and have a lovely time. The master tried to apologise and pull Jane away, but Sir Ian restrained him saying it was to the child's credit that she showed so much gratitude. He took out a fine lawn handkerchief to wipe her eyes. There now, dry your eyes. You can't go spoiling your pretty little face with tears. Let's see you smile. That's better. The girls continued to fire past, but Jane still clung to him. The master was standing beside them, seething with fury. After all the girls had left the hall, Sir Ian finally disentangled James' arms from around him. There now, little one, off you go, join your playmates, and I promise you will go to the seaside in the summertime. Jane reached up and touched his face, and breathed the words, 
Oh, Daddy, I love you, Daddy. I love you so much. The master heard every word. He said out of the side of his mouth to an officer, Take her to the punishment room. He then escorted his guest to the boys' section, where Sir Ian gave his second address. Jane ran to join the rest of the girls. They were agog with excitement, and she was the centre of attention. She entered proud and confident, her eyes dancing. That's my daddy, and he's going to take me away. They crowded around, chattering. But an officer was right behind Jane, and he grabbed her. You come along with me, my girl. The master wants to see you. Jane's heart leapt. Her bright eyes looked over to the other girls. There you see, my daddy's going to take me away now. That's why the master wants to see me. The officer looked grim, and most of the other girls looked nervous. Only Jane was happy as she walked confidently away with the officer. She was taken to the punishment room, pushed in, and then the door was locked. Jane was startled. She couldn't understand it. Why should they want her to wait here? Still, what did it matter? What did anything in the world matter now that her daddy had called her his child and promised to take her away? Jane sat down on the stool to wait. Jane waited for nearly two hours in the punishment room. She grew hungry and fidgety, but she was not worried. In fact, her mind was still buoyant. Her daddy had cuddled her and called her my child. She heard a key in the lock and jumped up expectantly, her face eager. The master and a male officer entered. Her face fell. Where's my daddy? she asked. The master was bent on vengeance, and her question only added fuel to his fury. He hit her full in the face, and she fell against the wall. You wicked girl, I'll knock that nonsense out of you. But Jane was a girl of spirit, and now that she had her protector, she wasn't afraid of anyone. Her eyes gleaming, she faced the master. I'll tell my daddy on you, she shouted. The master hit her again, harder. Sir Ian Astor Smalley is not your father, do you understand? Now say it after me. Sir Ian Astor Smalley is not my father. Say it. Now at this point, a curious thing happened. Curious to an adult, that is. Children frequently hear something quite different from what has actually been said, particularly if it is something new and unrelated to anything else in their experience. For example, throughout her childhood, my daughter thought our telephone number was fried potato. She had heard us say 53280. Jane thought the master had said, See, a nasty smelly is not my father. It didn't make sense. She stared at him in sullen amazement. Say it, shouted the master, raising his hand threateningly. The child continued to stare at him in amazement. A nasty smelly, she exclaimed, her tone raised inquiringly. You insolent little bastard, the man roared. To the officer, undress her. The officer grabbed her. At this, Jane really became alarmed and tried to pull away. Stop it, let me go. I'll tell my daddy on you, I will. Oh, the wickedness. Has she no shame? muttered the officer and continued to undress Jane until she stood naked before them. She was crying and frightened now, but still she resisted as much as her puny strength would allow. Hold her hands tight and turn her round ordered the master, selecting the leather-thonged whip from the wall. Jane saw him take it down and screamed, No, no, don't, let me go, don't. The first lash fell across her back, knocking all the breath out of her. Pain like fire shot through her body, and the second stroke fell before she had time to breathe. When the third fell with excruciating pain, Jane screamed, Daddy, Daddy! The fourth lash fell with added force. 
The three lead pellets at the end of the thongs cut into her back. The pain was like nothing we can imagine. A flogging across the back and shoulders causes indescribable agony because the bones, which are a mass of sensitive nerve endings, are only just beneath the skin surface, and there is very little soft tissue to protect them. The leather thongs cut the skin, exposing the bones to further pain and injury. The lead pellets struck in random places, tearing the flesh. By the fifth lash, Jane began to lose consciousness. All her weight fell onto the arms of the officer who held her, and she vomited down his trousers. Dirty little thing, he exclaimed, and jerked his knee upwards, catching her in the mouth. Her teeth clamped together over her tongue, and blood trickled out of her mouth. Still, the master continued. He had intended twenty lashes of the whip but his wife had cautioned him. Oh, you don't want to kill her. Questions might be asked. Ten lashes would be enough to teach the girl the lesson she deserves. Jane was only conscious of a terrible jolt to her body each time the lash fell. She could hear and see nothing beyond a red mist that swam all around her. Eight, nine, ten... The master brought down the last stroke with satisfaction. The officer let go of Jane, and she fell to the floor. She had wet herself, and she slid into the urine that was mixed with vomit and blood. Jane was eight years old. Get her to the dormitory. She's to come to my office at eight o'clock in the morning before she goes to school. The master issued the orders, hung the whip on the hook, and left the punishment room. A nurse and a female officer came to collect Jane and take her up to the dormitory. The nurse was shocked, but the officer, who had seen it all before, was blasé. Ah, oh, she'll get over it. Good beauty never did a child any harm. Come on, get up on your feet, you lazy girl, and put your dress on. The nurse was horrified. You can't put a dress on with her back like that. She needs lint and gauze and ointments. Well, she won't get them, said the female officer. The master would never stand for favouritism. The nurse took off her apron and wrapped the child in it. Jane could barely stand, let alone walk. So the nurse carried her upstairs to the dormitory. She laid her on the bed face down and fetched a bowl of cold water. She sat beside the bed for hours, bathing the girl's back with cold water to reduce the blood flow and restrict the terminal capillaries, so reducing the inflammation. In spite of the pain, Jane fell asleep. The nurse continued to bathe her back, and all the girls crept into the dormitory, subdued and silent and slipped into bed. A little girl with blonde hair crept up to the nurse. She was crying piteously. She said her name was Peggy, and she laid her fair hair against Jane's dark curls, whispering to her, kissing her, and sobbing. She asked the nurse if she could help, and took a cold sponge and bathed Jane's back just as the nurse had showed her. Together, the stunned and silent nurse and the weeping little girl ministered to the stricken Jane until Peggy was so tired that she too fell asleep. It was probably the action of the nurse and her child helper that saved Jane's life. All night she drifted in and out of consciousness and the nurse sat up with her through the long hours. The blood on her back was clotting the nurse noted with satisfaction, and the child could obviously move her legs, so at least her spine had not been broken. The master had ordered that Jane should report to his office at 8 a.m., but Jane could not be roused. The mistress was called. She declared that the child was shamming and pulled the mattress so hard that Jane fell onto the floor where she lay immobile. 
The mistress then looked coldly at her, turned her with her foot, and declared that she could have the day in bed, but must be ready for school the following morning. Thinking to be helpful, the nurse said, The child has been calling for her daddy all night, madam. Do you think it would be helpful if we were to fetch him? To her surprise, the mistress exploded. Her daddy? Oh, the iniquity, the sinfulness. Will there be no end to this child's wickedness? And she stormed off to tell the master that something else must be done to purge Jane of her lies. Jane was not able to go to school the next day, nor for many days after that. Gradually the pain eased and her mind began to clear. She was able to stand and to take a little food. She barely spoke and scarcely raised her eyes from the ground. The mistress came to the dormitory to tell her that all this shamming would not be tolerated a moment longer and she must go to school. But first the master wished to see her. Jane went deathly white and started to shake all over. Her legs gave way and she sank to the floor. An officer hauled her to her feet and dragged her downstairs. As she approached the door of the master's office, Jane vomited all down her apron. The mistress was furious and tore off the apron. The master sat at his desk and eyed Jane up and down. The officer kept hold of her or she would have fallen. You wicked child, you monstrous liar. Seems there is no end to your depravity. In spite of just chastisement, you persist in calling Sir Ian Astor Smelly your father. If you ever do so again, I will flog you without mercy. As a reminder of your wickedness and as an example to others, you will be deprived of your dress and you will wear a sack. Now go. Jane was taken away and her dress removed. A sack with three holes for head and arms was put on her with string tied around the waist. Her hair was shorn and she was sent to school like that. If Miss Sutton was horrified at her appearance, she was even more horrified at the change in the child's behaviour. The little girl sat shivering and cringing and reacted with terror if anyone, even the other children, spoke to her. She did not read, and her hand shook so much she was unable to write. For two whole weeks she said absolutely nothing. The headmistress wrote to the master of the workhouse, asking what had happened. He replied that he had absolute authority over the workhouse children and was answerable to no one. He reminded the headmistress that he was a member of the board of governors of the school. If there was any interference, he was in a strong position to complain to the chairman about the conduct and competence of the headmistress. No further action was taken. Jane started bedwetting. The workhouse punishment for this was that the offending child would be stood on the detention platform, which was at the front of the dining hall, visible to everyone, holding her wet sheet. The child had no breakfast that day. Morning after morning, Jane, shorn of her hair and wearing a sack, stood miserably on that platform, clutching a wet sheet. Day after day, she went to school with no breakfast. This morning penance continued with monotonous regularity. The scars on Jane's back healed more quickly than the scars on her mind. In fact, her mind and personality never did fully recover. She was never seen to smile, nor heard to laugh. Her buoyant, bouncing step changed to a cringing shuffle, her voice to a whisper. Jane's mind was largely blank. She had very little memory of the events that led up to her flogging, and she hadn't the faintest idea why it had occurred. Nothing made sense, but she was clear in her mind that her daddy had come to the workhouse. He had stroked her hair, called her my child, and said he would take her away in the summertime. The spring came and Jane knew that the summer would follow. It would not be long now. 
She only had to endure and be good and not get into any more trouble. Her daddy would come, as sure as the summer sunshine, and take her away from the workhouse forever. This fragile dream she clung to, it was her one solace in her misery. The summer days were drawing out. There was a buzz of excitement amongst the workhouse girls. They were going on holiday. It had never happened before. Jane's crushed spirits rose a little. August arrived and preparations were made. Summer dresses and sandals were provided. The girls could talk of nothing else. There was a fever pitch of excitement. The day for departure arrived. The girls were standing in the dining hall after breakfast, and everything was ready. The mistress entered. Right now, form a line and march out quietly, where we'll proceed to the station. The girls stepped forward. Not you. The mistress pointed at Jane. Stay where you are. The other girls marched out. Sick disappointment took possession of Jane. She saw the last girl leave heard footsteps echo down the corridors and doors banging. And then silence. Now it was that Jane's heart finally broke. Now her torture was physical, mental, emotional and spiritual. The utter desolation of rejection. Her daddy was not going to take her away. Her daddy did not love her. That was why she was in the workhouse. He had put her there because he did not want her, and she would never see him again. The knowledge of rejection, of being unwanted, is more terrible to live with than anything else. A pain entered Jane's body from which she would never be free. Frank had but a dim recollection of his father. He remembered a tall, strong man whom he held in awe. He remembered his big voice and huge, rough hands. To be like his father was his only ambition, and he worshipped him. He remembered his mother much more clearly, his sweet, gentle mother, who was never strong because she was always coughing. He remembered the sound of her voice as she sang to him and played with him. Above all, he remembered her cuddles as she put him to bed. In the winter, his mother hardly went out of doors because of her weak chest, and his father would say as he went off to work, Now, you look after your mother while I'm away, Frank lad. I'm relying on you to take care of her for me. And Frank would look up at his God with big solemn eyes and accept the task as a sacred duty. When a tiny baby was born, so tiny that everyone said she would not live, Frank was four years old. He was mesmerised by this tiny creature who needed so much care. Not for a moment did he resent the hours of attention given to the baby. In fact, he liked to help. The most fascinating thing of all was to watch his mother breastfeeding the baby. He watched, spellbound, this mysterious and beautiful ritual as the baby sucked and the milk oozed from the nipple. The baby was premature and sickly, and for a long time her life hung in the balance. His father said to him many times, Oh, you've got a special job to do, young man. You've got to look after your little sister. That's your job now, lad. So Frank watched over her, and hardly went out to play because he was so busy looking after his little sister. The baby gained strength and became quite robust, although she always remained small. She was called Peggy, and after the christening, Frank's father said, You done a good job there, son. I'm proud of you. Then catastrophe struck. Typhoid was raging through East London. His huge, strong father was hit by the disease and died within days. His mother went out to work, cleaning offices in the early hours and again each evening, leaving Frank to look after Peggy. One evening... It was cold and she was coughing badly, but she went nonetheless. Money had to be earned or they would be homeless. Frank did as he had so often done before. He put wood that he had found on his way home from school onto the fire. 
made tea for himself and Peggy, played with her, then put her to bed, creeping in beside her for warmth. In the middle of the night, he woke, aware that something was wrong. It was pitch black and the quiet was terrifying. He could hear Peggy breathing, but something was missing. Nausea seized Frank as he realised that his mother was not there. He crept out of bed and found the matches. He struck one, and the flame leapt up, lighting the room momentarily. His mother was not there. Blinded by tears, he crept back into bed and held Peggy in his arms. He was six years old. Frank and Peggy's mother was asthmatic and bronchitic and had been fighting off a chest infection for weeks. She had a mile to walk to the bus, and the freezing mist rising off the river had got into her lungs. By the time she got to the building where she was employed, she felt more dead than alive. She went to the cupboard to get out her things, but the bucket felt so heavy that she could scarcely drag herself around. She fell down the stairs, knocking the bucket over as she fell. She was drenched with water and lay on the stone floor all night. In the morning they found her dead. Frank and Peggy were admitted to the infant section of the workhouse, where boys and girls under seven were housed. They were treated not unkindly. Frank submitted to having his head shaved, but when he saw a large woman doing the same to Peggy, horror struck his heart. His mother was dead. He had promised his father he would look after Peggy. In a hysteria of fear and rage, he rushed at the woman and butted her in the stomach. She grabbed the boy and thrashed him soundly, whilst another officer shaved Peggy. Poor little Peggy looked like a tiny Martian when they had finished, and Frank sobbed with impotent rage. End of Disc One Shadows of the Workhouse, Disc 2 Frank and Peggy were dressed in workhouse clothes and taken to a large bare room about 40 feet long by 20 feet wide with high uncurtained windows and rough floorboards. You play quietly with the other children until tea time. The door was shut and the officer left. They stood shyly looking at about 40 other children, all wearing the same clothes. Frank, acutely self-conscious that he and Peggy had no hair, tried to hide her under his jacket. A boy of about his age ran up to them, shouting, You're new! You're new! Where have you come from? What's your name, Baldy? Who's this little squirt? He pulled at Peggy's arm and tickled her scalp. Frank flung himself at the boy with savage fury. All the rage that had been building up during the day was concentrated in his attack. Peggy was terrified and ran screaming to a corner, where she crouched down, hiding her head. A little girl with long, dark ringlets left the others and put her arms around the sobbing child. Don't cry, please don't cry. They're only fighting. Boys are always fighting. Here, sit on my knee. The girl sat down on the floor and Peggy climbed onto her knees. The girl smiled happily. You're like a little doll. I've never had a doll, but I've seen them. And you're better because you're real. Will you be my friend? My name's Jane, and I'm four. What's yours? Peggy's tears stopped, and Jane sat quietly cuddling her. Frank knew instinctively that if he lost this fight, Peggy would never be safe from their torments. After a few minutes, his adversary was on the floor. Truce, give in, he called out. Frank turned to face the others. He raised his fists defiantly. Anyone else want to go? No one stepped forward. Frank swaggered over to the corner where Peggy sat on Jane's knee. Thanks, he said. She's only two and she's scared. Her name's Peggy and I'm Frank. The girl had a merry laugh, open features and piercing blue eyes. Frank liked her with the instinctive affection that recognises a kindred spirit. He liked the way she was nursing Peggy, and he saw the contentment with which the little girl responded to the older one. 
he knew he could trust her. Let's be friends, he said. Frank approved of Jane's gentle ways with Peggy, and he also liked her naughtiness. She was always playing tricks and pranks, making everyone laugh. Nothing seemed to quench her high spirits. She got thrashed soundly, but Jane just rubbed her bottom, shook her curls defiantly, and did not seem to care. But over the next few weeks, the pain of his mother's death would reduce Frank to tears. The night times were the worst. Alone in the darkness, sobbing quietly, he would creep over to Peggy's bed and get in beside her, and they would sleep together till morning. After a year, Frank and two other boys were taken to the matron's office. She said abruptly, You are big boys now, you are seven. We are taking you to the boys' section today. Wait in the hallway, the van will come for you at nine o'clock. The boys did not know what she meant, but it was all very exciting. They'd never been in a van before, so they clambered in willingly, ready for adventure. The van started with a jerk, and they were thrown off the bench onto the floor. They shrieked with laughter. This was going to be a good day, a ride in a van. You wait till we get back and tell the others. The van stopped twice, and other boys climbed in. Soon there were eight boys, all shouting and skidding around the floor as they turned corners, or waving at people out of the van's small back window. Everyone turned to look, because motorised transport was comparatively unusual in those days. The boys felt very privileged, and infinitely superior to the people walking or travelling in horse-drawn wagons. Eventually the van stopped, and the door opened. Frank saw a very large grey stone building, and he did not much like the look of it. Where am I? he asked. This is the boys' section. You come here when you're seven and stay until you're fourteen, said a tough-looking man, workhouse officer. Where's Peggy? he demanded. I don't know who Peggy is, but she's not here. Peggy's my sister and I look after her. My dad told me to, the officer laughed. Well, someone else will have to look after her. No girls are allowed in here. Frank was unsure and frightened as they were taken to the master's office. The interview was brief. They were told they must obey the rules, obey the officers at all times, or they would be punished. The master then said, You start school tomorrow. Frank had wanted to ask about Peggy, but the master so terrified him he did not dare speak. He followed the officer to the dining hall with a feeling of panic in his heart. Lunch in a huge refectory with about a hundred and fifty other boys, some of them very big, was terrifying, and he could hardly eat. The reality of the situation began to dawn upon the new boys. They had left the nursery, where there were women officers and nurses, for the harsh, often brutal world of the workhouse proper. Back in the nursery, after breakfast, Peggy looked around for Frank, but could not find him. Bewildered and frightened, she stood on the bottom of the stair, hugging the banister. Peggy was three years old, and Frank had been with her all her life. She had not noticed the loss of her father when she was eighteen months old, and had only the vaguest memory of her mother. But Frank was her world, her life, her security— and she was utterly devastated. All day she stood on the bottom step, hugging the balustrades, sometimes sobbing. Sometimes she kicked the stairs and hurt her toe. Twice she wet herself, but still she wouldn't move. Jane tried to talk to her, but Peggy shook her shoulders and screamed, Go away! Leave her alone, said an officer to Jane. She'll get over it in a day or two. Towards evening, Peggy started to bang her head on the balustrade. It hurt, but she wanted it to. Perhaps Frank would come when he knew she'd hurt herself. When he didn't come, she sobbed uncontrollably, then slipped down onto the stairs in a deep sleep. A nurse carried her to the dormitory and put her to bed. For the next three months, Peggy hunted for Frank every day. She asked everyone, Where's Frank? And was told that he'd been transferred to the big boys' section. 
but she did not understand. She developed the habit of sitting alone in a corner and rocking herself. As time passed, she stopped looking for Frank and asked for him less until eventually she stopped asking. It was to be nine years before brother and sister saw each other again, and by that time they did not recognize each other. At the age of seven, Frank had entered an all-male world full of petty rules, upheld by harsh, uncompromising discipline and gratuitous tyranny. Many of the workhouse officers were men who had been brought up in a workhouse themselves during the 19th century, when conditions for paupers were simply appalling. A child had to have a very strong constitution to survive the brutality, the work, the cold, and the near starvation. These men knew of no other way of life, and to them it was only natural to impose the same regime on the boys in their charge. Frank was immediately set to work, cleaning potatoes, cutting cabbage, scrubbing out the huge cooking vats, burnishing the stoves, cleaning the brass, and hosing down the vast stone floors of the kitchen, and woe betide any boy who got himself wet. The list was endless and the day long, starting at 6 a.m. The boys also went to the local council school, and Frank found that if his tasks were not finished before he went to school, he got a beating from the officer in charge. And if he stayed behind to finish the job, he got a beating from the schoolmaster for being late. Small boys quickly learned that any sign of weakness would be mercilessly exploited by a bigger boy. Bullying, constant intimidation and jeering were the only response a smaller boy would gain from tears. Once, and once only, Frank asked an officer where Peggy was. The man must have told one of the older boys. The same day, in the washroom, a chorus went up. Peggy, Peggy, who's Peggy? Peggy's his top, what a fart. Peg, Peg, Peggy knows, what a pong. Frank burst into tears, and a big boy came and pushed him over onto the slippery floor. Gan, you ain't got no tart, you titch, said the boy, squeezing Frank's testicles so hard he screamed with pain. Frank lay awake for hours that night, as he so often did, his heart bursting for his mother and his sister. He had learned to make no sound so as not to attract attention and to keep very still so he seemed to be asleep. During these wakeful hours, he heard movements and soft footsteps, grunting and puffing and cursing sounds as iron bedsteads rattled and straw mattresses squeaked. Each dormitory had an officer in charge who slept in a closed cubicle, and each night a boy would slip quietly out of bed and go into the cubicle. What can one expect if a crowd of boys are thrown together with no escape and no female influence? All the boys were lonely. All of them were motherless. They had only each other in whom to find comfort and, let us hope, a little happiness, because for them life would be short. From 1914 to 1918, the older boys in Frank's dormitory were destined to be sent straight from the workhouses of England to the trenches of France, to die as cannon fodder in defence of king and country. In September 1914, a costermonger by the name of Tip called at the workhouse and asked to speak to the master. The master was prim and pompous, the cost of flashy and talkative. He explained in a curious husky voice that growled sometimes and squeaked and whistled at others that his lad had gone off to war and, and a coster must have a boy. How else was he going to do his trade like? And what he was looking for was a sharp little lad, eleven being the preferential age, seeing as how they learns the quickest. A boy who was a good worker, quick, and it didn't matter about no book learning because he never could see no use for that in a fish trade. But he, Tip, 
dedicate the boy himself and make a right sharp coster out of him. As how he could earn his living, honest like, and keep his head up with the best of them, and he would supply his lodgings and his victuals, least to say his docks he would, and had the master got such a boy who was hard working and willing. Workhouse masters were encouraged to offload inmates in order to reduce expenses, but they were not allowed to turn them out onto the streets unless provision for their maintenance was assured. The apprentice system was the answer. The master's mind had fixed on Frank. He was eleven, he was strong, he was hard-working, he was obedient, and he was, according to his school reports, one who has ability but must try harder. The boys were at tea and Frank was called out. Now stand up straight, look lively and don't answer back, said the master as he cuffed him round the ear. There's a man here wants to see you. They entered the office where the coster was waiting. This boy seems to answer your requirements. I give you my assurance that he's hard working. All our boys are trained to work. The coster looked Frank up and down and sucked his teeth. He pinched Frank's ear. You're a skinny little sprog. Can you lift a box of earrings? Frank didn't dare to answer back in front of the master, so he just nodded. Ain't you got a tongue, then? demanded the coster. Again, Frank nodded. Yes, he has, and he can use it to good effect when he wants to, answered the master. Well, that's what I need. A boy as can holler good and loud like and make more sit up. Well, this is the boy for you, then. He's got a voice like a foghorn, said the master conclusively. I'll take him, and if he don't come up to scratch, I'll bring him back next week. Frank was whisked off to the clothes cupboards, his workhouse uniform removed and ill-fitting street clothes put on him. The coster took him by the hand, and they stepped out into the road together. Tip was a flashy dresser. He wore green corduroy trousers and a shirt of vivid blue. His shoes were tied with enormous bows, and at his throat was a silk neckerchief of red and blue. His cap was a very large berry, made of the best velvet, and the colour, neither blue nor green, seemed to change with the light and movement. Tip considered himself a real swell, and his doxy admired him prodigiously. He glanced down at Frank and acknowledged that the boy was taking in his elegance. Oh, you go look sharp in our trade, Titch. No use looking like a bag of dirty washing. Ladies don't like it. And it's the ladies what does the buying, you see. So you got to please the ladies. That's rule number one. I oh, will have to get you some new clobber. I can't, if you're going round looking like that, the ladies would run away fritted, they would. I knows of a Jew what can fix you up cheap and natty like. Tip had started the sentence in his baritone voice, but as he came to the end of it, the words came out in a series of high, unexpected squeaks. Aware that Frank was listening with puzzled attention, he explained, Oh, it's the tubes what wears out with all that hollering. They gives out if you're a good coster like what I am. Cos they're too delicate to stand all that hollering. That's what I need a boy for to holler, along with lots of other things, all of which I'll teach you. But hollering will be one of your first jobs. Now, let's hear you holler. You see that little lad over there? Playing in that puddle. Well, you call out loud as you can now. Hey, mucky, your mum's coming. Frank caught the spirit of things and bellowed the words with all his strength. The boy jumped up and ran round the corner like a greyhound. Frank roared with laughter and squeezed Tip's hand. Oh, that's what I need, said Tip. Reckon as how you'll suit me, and if you could pick up the other tricks of the trade, quick like, we'll get on famous. Now we're getting to my lodgings, and my doxy's doll, see? And doll, oh, she's a rare one, but she won't stand no lip from boys, see? So don't you give her no lip. 
and you won't feel the back of her end. Tip rubbed his chin reflectively and muttered, and you don't want to feel the back of her end, I tell you. They climbed a dark and foul-smelling staircase to the fourth floor. A large and shapely woman ambled towards them. She wore a red skirt and a purple blouse with a row of jet buttons down the front, against which a full bosom pressed. Black jet beads hung to her waist, and heavy black hair hung down around her shoulders. When she smiled, her teeth were also black, as though they had been painted to match her outfit. She cried out, Oh, is this a little workhouse kid then? Oh, look, he's thin, the pet. And she pressed Frank's head to her bosom, an experience which she found to be not unpleasant, though the smell could have been sweeter. We'll have to give him some pie down dills, eh, Tip? Oh, well, let's get going then, said Tip, with a leer. It was nearly seven o'clock and the streets were filled with people. Apart from marching to school in a crocodile, Frank had not been outside the workhouse gates for years. He was filled with wonder. Here, a family was fighting, the man and woman threatening each other with equal fury. There, some boys were playing skittles. Yonder, a woman was fetching water from the pump whilst a crowd stood around with their buckets, gossiping as they waited. Frank had not seen women for years and couldn't take his eyes off them. Tip and Doll sauntered along, greeting people, chaffing children. Tip pinching the cheeks of young girls, Doll screaming across the street to another woman. They both dressed in a more gaudy fashion than any of their neighbours, and Frank felt proud to be with them. They entered a beer shop, high-ceilinged, bare-walled, with a wooden floor. The serving counter was at one end next to a raised platform with a piano on it, and Tip and Doll seemed to know everyone in the room. Frank was all eyes and ears. This was the high life indeed. You standing atop a reap? Pot of beer. Out? Oh. Say, yes, I done a Dugano flash. Good deal. Today? But call him. Look at him. Who's he? My Vendal, new lad. Give him some reeb and rota. Beer and water. Frank took his beer and sipped it, puzzled. Conversation continued. Jack, he had a regular tossin' o toll. Bad luck. And a showful. Bad money. Big aloof him. Fool him. He must have been flash garnered. Half drunk, of a time. On. No. Just a debino. Bad debt. Costas in those days spoke to each other almost entirely in back slang, incomprehensible to an outsider. This continued until well after the Second World War. Frank's eyes rested on each of these big confident men as he spoke but none was as flamboyant or assured as Tip, and the seeds of hero worship were sown in this young heart. He drank his beer. No one seemed to notice him. He was hungry, and Doll, who was flirting with a man sporting a walrus moustache, appeared to have forgotten the pie she had promised him. The beer shop filled up. Cards were brought out, and men sat down to the serious business of gambling. A group of boys in a corner were engaged in the equally serious business of three ups. A piano player started a tune, and everyone sang along, getting louder and louder at each chorus. A girl leapt onto the stage and started dancing with more vigour than grace, accompanied by shouts and catcalls from the audience. The beer flowed and the laughter swelled. Exhausted, Frank fell asleep on the floor. He was awakened by Doll screaming, Oh, poor little nipper! Here, Tip, you'll have to carry him. Take me for a monkey, said Tip scornfully. He shook Frank hard and pulled him to his feet. Come on, there's a day's work ahead. Doll was the worse for wear and hung on to Tip's arm as they walked through the streets. Frank, more asleep than awake, kept close behind them. They climbed the steps to the fourth floor 
A straw mattress and blanket were pulled out from behind the big feather bed and put on the floor under the table for Frank, who was only too thankful to lie down anywhere. He went to sleep to the comforting and familiar sounds of grunting and puffing and rhythmic bed rocking. Frank was awakened by a flannel soaked in cold water thrown on his face. He leapt up and banged his head on the table. Stunned, he gasped, What's up? Where am I? Tip spoke, but it was a very different tip from the evening before. Gone the flashy clothes, the easy swagger, and pleasant bonhomie. The morning revealed Tip the Costa, Tip the businessman, Tip of the calculating, clever, ruthless eye for a bargain. Out a bit sharp now, there's work to be done. Billings Gate opens at four, and it's three o'clock, and we've got to get the barrow and the gear and be there. Tip was already in his work trousers and was pulling on his heavy boots. Frank felt the urgency and leapt out of bed. He was still dressed from the night before and had only to pull on his boots. Good now, take that bag and we're off. Out in the night air, Tip was electric with energy. He kept doing little runs and skips and punching the air with his fists. He gave several short, barking shouts, took in great lungfuls of air and blew it out noisily. He was working himself up to a fever pitch, and Frank caught the energy. He ran along the dark street, alive to everything, tingling with anticipation. They went to a tunnel under a bridge. Other men were there already, and each man had a boy. A door was opened, revealing a pitch-black cavern, and a naphtha flare was lit with a match. The flame leapt up, revealing a stack of barrows, trucks, handcarts, donkey carts, bridles, hooks, chains, ropes, tarpaulins, a medley of wood and metal. Tip growled to Frank. Watch what I takes and be sure you remembers it. If you don't get the right gear, you can't do your job, and the tally bloke there, he'll cheat you if he can. He selected what would be needed for the day and paid the rental to the man with the flare. Push this here and let's get going. A boy called out, Hey, Yenon, you! Frank took no notice. The boy kicked him hard. Don't you answer then, Yenon? Tip explained. He means new one, that's you, see? Take the notice, you've got work to do. You'll pick up the lingo in no time. In pain and limping, Frank pushed the barrow. He had learned to hide all signs of weakness in the workhouse, and it had stood him in good stead. Now we must get a move on. Tip leaned his weight on the barrow and it sped over the cobbles, rattling on solid iron-framed wheels. Billingsgate was London's fish market and lay on the north bank of the Thames east of the monument. Fishing boats came in throughout the night and the market stalls laden with fresh fish were ready for business when the market opened at 4 a.m. Tip's electric excitement is, if anything, intensified and every nerve in his body seems to be quivering. A fishy, seaweedy smell hits his nostrils and he inhales deeply. Beautiful, beautiful. The noise all around is intense. Above the babble of voices, Frank can hear the shouts of salesmen standing on boxes, roaring out their merchandise and their prices a babel of competition. And some cod, best in the market, all alive. Fine Yarmouth bloaters, who's the buyer? Eels o, eels o, alive o. Wink, 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 all's best for tea. Here you are, Governor, fine brill. Come and look at them, Gov. You won't find better. Over here, finny addict. Addict, addict, Now or never, Wilkes, 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 I say. On all sides, everyone is asking, what's the price? While shouts of laughter from salesmen and customers, bargaining and bantering, pepper the noise of the crowd. Frank can see the white bellies of turbot shining like mother of pearl. Living lobsters, their claws flailing. Mounds of herrings with scales glittering like sequins. Huge baskets piled with grey oysters, 
blue mussels, pink shrimps, sackfuls of whelks, their yellow shells piled up high. Buckets of grey and white eels slithering and sliding over each other. Frank sees porters in strangely shaped leather helmets, rather like squashed pagodas, carrying fish baskets on their heads. 800 tonnes of fish pour in and out of Billingsgate every day, and all of it is unloaded and ported in this way. A man whose neck is set can carry 16 baskets, each weighing a stone, on his head. These powerful men are the backbone of the fish market. Frank flattens himself against a wall as one of these giants passes, shouting, Move over! Make way, please! Gangway! A thin man, trembling under the weight of his load, mutters through clenched teeth, Oh, shove to one side, can't you? Everywhere, ragged, desperate-looking men and boys are clamouring for the job of porterage, hoping to earn a shilling or two before the day's end. Through the arches of the open end of the huge covered building, silhouetted against the grey sky of dawn, Frank can see the masts and rigging of the oyster boats and lobster trawlers. Sails black against the skyline shift and tremble. He sees the red caps of the sailors as they draw in the sails. He hears the chug-chug of primitive engines. He hears the shouts of men as they unload their vessels. Keep close beside me, Tip growls, and listen to everything. Don't miss nothing, see? you got to learn how to buy. He assumes a nonchalant air and saunters down the gangway, whistling as though he were on holiday. He passes through the arches onto the quayside, where the river glides black and secretive, and silver threads of light pierce the wakening sky. They clamber over ropes and rigging, to the long row of oyster boats moored close along the wharf, known as Oyster Street in the trade, where the fishermen sell direct from their boats. No middlemen here, best prices, hisses Tip out of the corner of his mouth. Each boat has its blackboard and the master in his white apron walks up and down calling his prices. The holds are filled with oysters and sand, which a man turns over with a spade, rattling the masses of shells. Tip discusses the price with the master, shakes his head, and walks away, saying loudly to Frank, Well, I'd owe a better oyster down the sewers. The oyster merchant shouts after him. Tip ignores the shouts and clambers over shrimp nets and waits to reach a fisherwoman, with huge muscular arms shouting the price of shrimps. The master of the vessel is behind her, filling a jug with shrimps and letting them fall back like a shower of confectionery. Tip breaks the head off one and sniffs it. I would give that to my dog, he says, and hands it to Frank, who doesn't know what to do with it. Clambering over ropes, rigging, sails, cans of engine oil, netting, lobster pots, gang plants, ladders, baskets, trays, all littered over the quayside in a seeming mass of confusion. Tip and Frank scramble the whole length of Oyster Street. Nothing is bought. Six o'clock is approaching. Tip snaps into action, his nonchalance leaving him as fast as he had assumed it. He returns to the fisherwoman and buys shrimps at half her asking price. Oysters for a third. Brill and dab he buys which he had earlier disdained as poison, with a bucket of eels added to clear them. Buying is over and the excitement has passed. Tip hired a porter, a starved-looking man of sixty, and refused to pay the sixpence the man asked. Threepence, then, said the man humbly. I give you tuppence, take it or leave it. I can soon find another stronger than you, you miserable old skeleton. The man took it and staggered out of the gate to where Tip and Frank had left the barrow. And now for breakfast, said Tip.
Betty, my dear, I say, why, Betty, you look charming this morning. I'll draw up my chair here and get close in by this nice invite in fire. And you, Betty, my love, can have the infinite pleasure of supplying me with some good ham and eggs. And if you've got some nice hot muffins and butter, I'll have them and all, and some of your best rosy lee, good and strong. Betty, my love, why, you do look ravishing this fine morning. You can look after this young lad like what he was your own son. Bring him the same, cause he's new, and there's a hard day's work ahead. And likewise, a man can't go to work on an empty stomach. No more can a boy. Frank sat down to the best breakfast he'd ever had in his life. He ate with concentrated enjoyment. Men and boys came in and sat down. Betty rushed around serving. The fire crackled and tobacco smoke filled the air. Voices merged into a quiet hum and Frank fell asleep, his head on the table. A heavy hand hit his shoulder. Right now, it's eight o'clock, we've got to get going on the round. Tip walked swiftly out into the yard and Frank staggered after him, rubbing the sleep from his eyes. They arranged the cart together, Tip instructing every move, securing the sides, the shafts, the step, placing the trays, the weights and measures, the knives, bags and torn newspapers. At each move he would say, Now, don't forget this one. They started the round. If Frank thought that life in the workhouse was hard, that was because he had not experienced life as a coster. From that day on, he never stopped working, and he never stopped loving every minute of it. He hollered his way down the streets, bawling out the day's catch, shrimps, mackerels, herrings, whelks, his high-pitched voice carried from one end of a street to the other. He learned quickly, and within a month he could gut a fish so fast you wouldn't see him do it. He charmed the ladies with his appealing eyes. He flicked a mussel from its shell with a twist of the knife, faster even than tip. The round was about ten miles walking distance. Tip usually closed the barrow at about three in the afternoon. Anything left over was Frank's to sell. A tray was suspended round his neck, and he went out alone. Tip would size up the value of the fish on the tray and say what he wanted for it. Anything over that amount was commonly known as a bunt or bunce, and the boy could keep the money. This was regarded as a coster boy's pay, because they received no wages for their work, food and lodgings being regarded as quite sufficient recompense for a day's labour. Frank quickly discovered that this was to be the hardest part of his day's work. The tray was heavy and his legs soon felt heavy too. Buying was mostly over for the day and customers were few, so they had to be first attracted and then persuaded to buy. The fish was getting stale and nothing can disguise the smell or look of stale fish, especially in summer. Frank often had to trudge several miles before he had sold his stock and gained the money Tip demanded for it. Frequently, there was nothing at all left over for his bunt. But on other occasions, there was, and Frank was ecstatic at having earned himself sixpence or a shilling, a fortune for a boy who had never had anything of his own. To earn his bunt became his main aim, and often he did not return to the lodgings before nine or ten in the evening. He would then crawl under the table, dog-tired, and sleep until three a.m., when he was wakened to go to the market. Frank picked up the lingo within a few weeks and was soon talking fast and confidently in the incomprehensible jargon Costas proudly shared. He assumed the devil-may-care swagger of the other Costa lads. He copied Tip's easygoing banter with the ladies. He also copied Tip's flamboyant style of dress, achieved with a few cut-downs from the master dresser and a few bits such as a neckerchief and shoelaces, which he had bought with his bunts. His ambition in life was to buy himself a flashy cap. He adopted the coster's attitude to money. Spend it while you got it, tomorrow you may die. 
He saw that Costas worked hard and that a good trader earned a lot of money. He saw this money being thrown around each evening in the pubs and taverns with extravagant ease. Any man who had had a good day wouldn't hesitate to spend his entire profit on drinks for his mates. If he'd had a bad day, another Costa would buy for him. If any Costa was in Hard Street, there would be an immediate whip round for him. No Costa saved a penny for the future. Costas didn't live in homes, they lived in lodgings, where they dossed down for a bit and then moved on. The lodgings were always unspeakably squalid and cheerless because Costas and their women were hardly ever in them. Life was lived in the streets, the markets, the pubs, the penny hops, the penny gaffs, at the racetracks and in the boardy houses. Life with all its richness was lived outside. Costas went back to their lodging only for a few hours' kip before the next day dawned and the markets opened. Above all, Frank learned the trade. Unless he had been trained from boyhood, no man had the slightest chance of becoming a successful coster. The tricks and dodges, the graft, the guile, were just as important to learn as the skills of buying and bartering. Frank learned all this law from the other coster lads as they went around in the early evenings, selling off the day's leftovers and trying to earn an honest bunt. He learned to cover his fish with parsley to keep it smelling nice. He learned to squeeze a lemon over it to improve the taste. He added a few nuts to his store to increase his range. He learned to sell four pints of whelks as five by taking a bit off the top of each. He learned where he could sell fish heads and tails. He learned to mix dead eels with live ones to increase his stock by five to one. And they don't notice one's dead until they get some home. He made the acquaintance of an unscrupulous pie man who would take eels that had been dead for two days for ready money. He learned that herring and mackerel look fresher by candlelight. So he carried a candle stuck in a turnip for dark evenings. By the age of twelve, Frank was as sharp as a terrier. He was up to every dodge in the business and there were some who said he was as clever a man as Tip. He spent long hours in the markets. He knew the price of everything and forgot nothing. He was a master of his trade. At the age of 13, Frank decided it was time to go it alone. He'd be his own master and keep his own profits. He left Tip and Doll and moved into a common lodging house for men the back room of a public bar that was open only to the water's edge. The floor was rough stone, the ceilings and walls unplastered. For tuppence a night, he could hire a straw mattress and a blanket on the floor. Any other lodgings would cost him tenpence a night. The men were rough, obscene, vicious, and put the fear of God into the lad. But he was growing fast, was quick on his feet and good with his fists. His greatest terror was of being robbed. He had seen it happen more than once. Frank kept his stock money in his socks and slept each night with his boots on and tightly laced. Most of the men in the lodging house were casual labourers. All were unskilled. Frank considered himself an aristocrat, being skilled in the fish trade. He hired his own gear, bought his own stock and sold in the streets keeping all his profits which he spent on flashy clothes, fancy food, beer, girls, the penny hops, the penny gaffs, and gambling. Gambling. By the age of 14, it would be safe to say Frank was a desperate gambler. All the Costa men and boys gambled, but none more seriously than Frank. Not a spare moment would pass, but he would toss a coin and invite a bet on it. He did not care what he played for or who he played with, as long as he had a chance of winning. Every day he worked untiringly, spurred on by the thought of the money he would earn, which he could lay against the odds with the next gamester he met. Many a time he lost not only his money, but his jacket as well, but nothing could dampen his ardour for the game. 
the Costa boys met under railway arches, in pub yards, on the quaysides, or even on the shingle when the tide was out. If ever a group of boys' backs and heads were seen crouching in a circle, it would be safe to say it was a group of gamblers, and ten to one Frank would be in the middle, calling the loudest, the quickest, the fiercest. Then one evening, Frank lost all his earnings, his neckerchief, his jacket, he even pledged his magnificent velvet cap, and lost it. Frank tried to strike a jaunty pose, and walked away as a new game started. He walked for hours, not feeling the wind blowing off the Thames, his mind full of the next game, when he would get even. He'd show him. He'd get his money back and more. He'd get even. His luck would be back next week. Not for an instant did it occur to him that he had been a fool. The passion for gambling had him in its obsessive grip. Frank trudged on. Ahead of him was a little nipper in baggy trousers and shoes down on the uppers, leading a little girl, not yet out of nappies, by the hand. The little girl was laughing as she toddled along. Suddenly she fell and let out a howl of pain. The boy helped her up. He wiped her eyes with his sleeve and rubbed her knees. He laughed and said, All better now. But the little girl wouldn't be consoled. She rested her blonde head on his shoulder and put her arms around his neck. He picked her up and carried her into a court. Life turns on little things. The momentous events in history can leave us untouched, while small events may shape our destinies. Frank stood quite still in the street, suddenly feeling a cold uncertainty enter his heart. He shivered and leaned against the wall, feeling unexpectedly dizzy. What was it? Everything seemed so cloudy. He felt tiny soft arms around his neck. He breathed in and could smell the lovely scent of a baby's hair. He shivered and rubbed his eyes, his mind in turmoil. He tried to shake off the image of the tiny girl with the blonde hair. All right, he had a sister and she was in the workhouse, so what? That wasn't his fault, was it? Oh, let her look after herself like he'd done. Anyway, he hadn't thought of her for years, and likely as not she'd forgotten all about him. He shook off the thought of the girl and whistled his way back to his lodgings. But for the first time in years, he dreamed of his mother. With a cry of anguish, he sat up in bed, remembering that terrible night when she had not returned, remembering holding little Peggy in his arms until the next day, when they had been taken to the workhouse. At the sound of the other costers getting ready to go to market, Frank asked his mate for the loan of some stock money. At Billingsgate, he was the cool, hard professional buyer again. He hollered his way through his round with double the usual energy and was sold out by 2 p.m. He found his mate to repay the loan, then counted his earnings. There was enough for stock money for tomorrow and a tightener, dinner, today. He went to Betty's and ordered the best cake in Sydney, steak and kidney, with spuds and two doorsteps, thick lumps of bread, followed by spotted dick, currant pudding and custard, and a pint of reeb, beer. No, he thought again, make that two pints of reeb. That's what a man needed inside him, some good grub. He hadn't eaten since breakfast yesterday, what with the game and the queer goings on. No wonder it felt funny. A big man came in. He'd hired a boy to hold the bridle of his horse and called out as he entered. You look after her, lad, while I'm away. Frank heard the words and remembered as clearly as though it were yesterday that he had promised his father he would look after his mother and his sister. Frank sat at the table for a long time, unable to move. His sister, as far as he knew, was alive and in the workhouse. He dug his nails into his hands as he remembered the tyranny and cruelties he had endured. He prayed that it had not been as bad for his sister in the girls' section. He had never prayed before, 
but now he did, and he vowed to heaven, his fists clenched, that if his sister were still alive, he would get her out of the workhouse. He would look after her as he had promised his father. Frank found himself in the workhouse once more. This time he was waiting in the master's office. He had smartened himself up as best he could and was waiting with dread in his heart. Was she still alive? Footsteps came along the corridor and he stood up. Frank's first surprise at meeting the master after nearly four years was how little he was. He had a childhood memory of a large, terrifying man whose word was absolute law and who had the power to beat and flog for the slightest misdemeanor. Yet here was this flabby little man, about a head shorter than Frank himself, who looked as if he hadn't the strength to lift a bit of cod off a plate, never mind a box of them off a slippery quayside. Frank looked at his puny muscles and nearly laughed. But he had come for a purpose and must be polite. He inquired about his sister, was she still alive? Yes, the master replied, she was. Frank gave a huge, shuddering sigh of relief. Where was she then? The master replied guardedly that she was in the girls' section, where she was well cared for. Frank's joy was unconfined. Could he see her then? The master was prim. No, boys were not allowed in the girls' section. Frank's joy at knowing she was alive was greater than his disappointment at not being allowed to see her. If he couldn't see his sister because of the rules, what were the rules about taking her away altogether? The master was surprised at the boy's persistence and explained, condescendingly, that any relative could apply for the discharge of an inmate and, provided the applicant could provide adequately for said inmate, the application would be considered favourably. Frank's quick brain translated. You mean if I can support my sister, I can get her out of here? The master nodded. And what would you mean by support? The master looked at the eager 14-year-old and smiled at the impossibility of his hopes. I would say, firstly, that the applicant must be of good character and must have decent accommodation. He must prove himself able to support the inmate for whose discharge he is applying and should have a reasonable sum of money saved against illness or loss of work. And how much would you call a reasonable sum? The master smiled archly. Oh, I would say twenty-five pounds. That is a fair sum. Frank swallowed. Twenty-five pounds? Ask a working boy today to save £25,000, and he might swallow and turn pale, just as Frank did. The master concluded the interview and assumed he would see no more of the boy. Frank dragged his feet miserably back to the lodging house. The obstacles seemed insurmountable. When he entered the squalid doss house, in which about twenty men slept and ate, he realised the master was right. He couldn't possibly bring a girl here. He would have to be able to provide for her and find somewhere decent to live. Frank then worked as he had never worked before. He did his fish round as ever, but instead of knocking off when he had sold it all, he looked into the fruit and nut trade and hawked them around the pubs and theatres and music halls until ten or eleven at night. He doubled his income. He changed his habits and became something of an outcast from his old mates, because he never gambled, never joined them in the tavern. He opened a post office national savings account, because he knew that in a communal lodging house he would eventually be robbed. When he learned that he would earn 4% on his investments, he was thrilled. By the age of 15, he had saved eight pounds. Frank went into the fried fish market, arranging for the fish to be cooked at a baker's and employing a lad to hawk it around at a fixed rate, plus the bunting system. He looked into the roast chestnut market and worked out that the hire of the gear would pay for itself around Christmas time. He was right. 
By the age of 16, he had 25 pounds in his post office account. He then looked round for a room to rent for himself and Peggy. It had to be decent. His sister would be 12 years old now, quite the young lady. He found a room on the top floor of a house at eight shillings a week, plus two shillings for the rent of the furniture. It was an upper-class house, he felt. There was a gas stove on the middle landing for everybody's use, and a tap in the basement. There was even a lavatory in the yard. He was well satisfied. Frank stood again in the master's office. He had on his best clothes and his post office book in his pocket. The master was astonished when he saw the proof of £25 saved in only two years. How had a boy of sixteen achieved it? He looked at him with new respect. Well, your request will have to be considered by the Board of Guardians. He gave Frank the date and time of the meeting and told him to come back on that evening. The Guardians debated the application. They agreed to release the girl if she wished to go with her brother. Frank was called into the boardroom and interrogated. They seemed satisfied and were especially impressed by the post office book. They told him to stand by the window and Peggy was called away from her evening duties. Peggy was in the wash house helping to prepare the younger girls for bed. It was a duty she loved and there was always play and laughter. An officer came in. The guardians want to see you. Come with me. Peggy had no time to feel alarm. She was shown into the big boardroom where a group of gentlemen sat around a table. Frank, standing inconspicuously by the window, watched her every step. She was taller than he had expected, a grown girl in early puberty. He liked her dishevelled hair and laughing features, still damp from the wash house. He saw with a stab of pity the fear and uncertainty as she stepped towards the table. The chairman said, not unkindly, Your brother has made an application to remove you from the workhouse. My brother? Peggy looked bewildered. Yes, you have a brother, didn't you know? She shook her head. The anguish inside Frank made his legs turn to jelly. Well, you have, and he asks permission to take you out of our care and to look after you himself. Do you wish to go with him, or do you prefer to stay here with your friends? Peggy didn't say anything, and a member of the board said sharply, Speak up, child, and answer the chairman when he is good enough to speak to you. Peggy's lip trembled and she began to cry, but still she said nothing. Frank's anguish turned to dread. What if she did not want to come? It was a possibility he had not even considered. The chairman, who had daughters of his own, said gently, pointing to Frank, This is your brother, Frank. It is to be regretted that you have not seen him since you were three years old, but now he has applied for your discharge, and we, your guardians, are satisfied that he can provide for you. Do you wish to go with him? Peggy looked towards the window and saw a tall stranger. He did not mean a thing to her. Insecure children are terrified of change. She thought of the happy laughter in the wash house and her friends at school and in the dormitory. She stared at this unknown young man, and her heart was set on her friends and the routine she had always known. Frank saw rejection in her eyes, and before she could speak, he stepped swiftly across the room. Stay where you are, you have no right, shouted the master. Frank took no notice. He walked straight to Peggy and stood looking down at her, then slowly he extended the little finger of his right hand and curled it round the little finger of her right hand. He held it close and grinned. Hello, Peg. The action stirred her memory as nothing else could have done. Holding little fingers was a special and intimate gesture from a childhood almost lost and forgotten. 
but now she remembered. A dim, far-off memory of loss and longing stirred within her. She looked at this tall lad, and the love she had not known for years flooded her heart. She squeezed his little finger in return and smiled a smile of secret understanding. He saw the dimples in her cheeks and knew he had seen them before. Then with sudden, impetuous warmth, she threw her arms about his neck and leaned her head on his shoulder. The intoxicating smell of her hair sent a thrill through Frank's tense body, and he relaxed, knowing that all would be well. Peggy turned to the chairman and curtsied. I will go with my brother, if you please, sir. As Peggy danced along the pavement, looking up at Frank, his big rough hand grasping her own felt familiar. His arm round her shoulders was familiar too. Something in his touch struck a chord within her that she knew and responded to. Frank was jubilant. He felt like a king. He had got her out of that place, his little sister, and he would never let her go back. He took her to the lodgings, in a respectable street, he pointed out. He was proud to show her the facilities. He led her up to the second floor and showed her the last word in luxury, the gas stove on the landing, where she could cook. They climbed two more flights of stairs, and he proudly flung open the door. It was a small attic room with a sloping roof and a garret window. The walls were unpainted and bits of plaster were falling off. The ceiling was yellow and stained with damp. The furniture consisted of a rough wooden table and chair, a narrow iron bedstead with coarse grey army blankets, a wooden box, a candle stuck in a bottle, a jug and wash bowl, and a chamber pot. But to Peggy it seemed like heaven. She threw her arms around Frank. It's lovely, it's lovely. Are we really going to live here? Her eyes filled with uncertainty. Well, I have to go back. Don't let me go back. I want to stay here with you. He folded her in his arms and said fiercely, No, you'll never go back. Did you hear me? Never. We'll be together always, that's her promise. Now. Let's see that smile a yawn, so I can see them dimples. She smiled with trusting confidence, and he put his little fingers into the dimples. Well, you'll have to smile a lot more often, you know. He brought in wood and lit a fire in the grate. He had bought muffins and butter, and they sat on the floor by the fire, toasting the muffins. They were so delicious she couldn't stop eating them, and the butter ran down her chin. He chuckled and wiped it off with his finger. She took hold of his hand and licked the butter off his finger, looking up at him with melting eyes. A thrill ran through him, and he did not know what to say. She murmured, Muffins, muffins and butter. Can I eat muffins forevermore, Frank? Course you can. I'll see to that. Muffins every day if you want some. And can I have jam and honey and cream? Whatever you want, my little sister, you can have, you'll see. Peggy sighed with happiness. Satiated with muffins and warmth and the emotion of the day, her eyes began to close. Frank watched her closely, thinking he had never seen such a pretty face. She was so much prettier than the Costa girls most of his mates had. They were rough-looking girls with loud voices and dirty hair. He leaned forward and touched her hair. It was like silk, and so fine he had to blow it just to watch it move. She felt his breath on her face and opened her eyes. Come on, little girl, it's time for bed. Frank used the words he had used when he was six and she was two. A distant memory stirred, and she giggled, leaning back against the wall, kicking her heels against the floor. Can't make me. He leaned towards her and took off her boots and socks, saying as he did so, 
This little piggy goes to market. This little piggy stayed at home. And she caught the rhyme and finished. And this little piggy goes wee, 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 all the way home. Home, Frank. Not the workhouse, but home. With you. He undressed the sleepy young girl just as he had done nearly ten years before. He put her into bed and she fell asleep straight away, snuggled into the warm blanket that he pulled around her. He threw another log on the fire. He felt wide awake, teeming with emotions. He'd done it. He got her out. He stroked the hair of the sleeping child and a wave of tenderness swept over him. How soft and pretty girls were. He stroked the smooth white skin of her arm and compared it with his own, all covered with black hairs. He took up her hand, then noticed with fury that it was all red and rough, her nails short and broken, with little cracks at the fingertips. The bastards. They'd got her scrubbing and doing heavy washing already. He swore angrily to himself and vowed that Peggy would never have to work so hard again. She would go to school. His sister was going to have a good education and grow up to be a lady. He'd see to it, he would. He'd better get some shut-eye. He'd have to be up at three to go to the market. It was more important than ever that his trading showed a profit. But he didn't want to disturb the magic of the moment. The firelight was fading, but he could see the dark curve of her lashes against her pale skin. He could see the slender white shoulder against the grey blanket. He leaned over and kissed it, very gently so as not to disturb her. This was the best day of his life. Quite suddenly he felt really tired. The excitement of the day had caught up with him at last. He undressed and crept into bed, hoping not to wake her. But the bed was so small that he had to push her over to make room for himself. She sighed and stretched out a sleep-warmed arm, which, feeling his body, curled around his neck and drew him towards her. She murmured, Is that Frank? Is that really Frank, my lovely brother? Oh, I love you so much. He kissed her eyes, her hair, her face, her mouth. He passed his hands down her slender body, and fire ran through him as he felt the circle of her tiny firm breasts and buttocks. She was neither asleep nor awake, but she loved him with all her heart and mind, with all her soul and her body. Their union was as inevitable as it was innocent. Peggy was singing her way through her scrubbing and polishing at Nanata's house. It was always nice to hear her. Sister Julienne casually remarked, You sound happy. How's Frank these days? Frank? Oh, well, he's had a bit of stomach ache recently, but a dose of Epsom salts will soon see that off. A few weeks later, she confided to Sister, Frank's still got the stomach ache, Sister. Salts don't seem to do him any good. What else can I give him? Questioning revealed that Frank's stomach ache had lasted for six weeks. Sister advised seeing the doctor. But Frank would not go to the doctor. Men like Frank never do. I've never been to a sore bones in my life, and I'm not starting now. I'll work it off, you'll see but he couldn't work it off, and a couple of weeks later he had to shut up his stall in Crisp Street Market at 11am, leaving half the fish unsold, something unheard of. The pain had got so bad he couldn't continue. Peggy put him to bed and called the doctor, who examined him and advised hospital. Tests revealed the early stages of carcinoma of the pancreas. Radium treatment was advised. At Nanata's house, Peggy sought reassurance. What's the pancreas, anyway? It's only a tiny organ in the body, they tell me. It's not like the liver or the stomach. 
The radium treatment will get rid of it in no time, I suppose. We did not say that no one had ever been known to recover from cancer of the pancreas. Frank handed over the lease of his stall to a mate for three months, saying he would want it back when he'd had a good rest and was better. He told Peggy not to give up her work because he didn't want to be fussed. However, Peggy argued that this would be the only time in their lives when he was not working six days a week and they could treat it as a holiday. Within a few weeks, we were requested to take Frank for home nursing. Sister Julienne and I went to assess him. Peggy and Frank lived in a prefab on the Isle of Dogs. These were small, ready-made buildings erected in huge numbers after the war to house some of the thousands of people whose homes had been destroyed. The prefabs were an emergency measure and intended to last only four to five years, but many of them lasted 40 to 50 years. They were very pleasant, cosy, and greatly preferred to the terraces that had been destroyed by the bombs. As we approached the prefab estate in the morning sunlight, it looked charming, with the low buildings, leafy trees full of sparrows, and the river lapping in the background. Their tiny garden, about six to ten feet of space all around the house, was well tended with flowers and cabbages and runner beans growing well. The front door opened straight into the sitting room, which was comfortable and pretty. It was also spotlessly clean. Peggy greeted us with her usual happy smile. Oh, it's good of you to come. He's in bed at the moment, but he's getting along nicely. He's had two weeks of the radium treatment now, and he says he'll be back at the market in no time. We went into the bedroom, and I was thankful that Sister Julienne was with me. Had I been alone, my reaction at seeing Frank for the first time in about three months would probably have betrayed my shock. He looked ghastly. He lay in the middle of the big double bed, his eyes sunken, his skin grey. He had lost so much weight that his flesh hung in wrinkles, and he had lost most of his hair. Sister went straight up to him with her gentle warmth. Hello, Frank. How nice to see you again. We miss you at Nanotta's house and look forward to your return. The other man's good. We've no complaints, but it's not the same as having you. Frank smiled. His eyes, sunk deep into their bony sockets, gleamed with pleasure. Oh, I'll be back right enough, sister. It's only a few more weeks of this radium, and I'll be on my feet again. Sister examined him. She carefully moved his emaciated body, the arms and legs that seemed to have insufficient muscle to lift their own weight. I went to the other side of the bed and caught in my nostrils the smell of death as I leaned over him. Strangely enough, Peggy did not seem to notice how desperately ill he was. She kept saying things like, He's getting on fine. He's getting stronger each day. Or... He ate all the milk pudding I made for him. That shows he's getting well, doesn't it? I was struck by the fact that we all see what we want to see. Peggy appeared to have closed her mind to the reality of Frank's condition to the extent that she literally couldn't see it. To her, Frank was exactly the same as he had always been, her brother and her lover. He was the beat of her heart, the blood in her veins. The physical changes, obvious to anyone else, she just did not see. It was arranged that I should call for home nursing twice a day and that Sister would come any time that Peggy requested. The control of pain is the first responsibility of anyone involved in the care of the dying. Pain is a mystery that we cannot fathom because there is no measure Everyone's tolerance of pain differs, therefore the correct dose of analgesic will differ. One must balance the strength of analgesic to the level of pain perceived and not allow the pain to develop beyond the patient's tolerance. Frank was having half a grain of morphine three times a day. Later this was increased to four 
then six times daily. It was sufficient to dull his pain to an acceptable level, but did not impair his faculties. He once said, Every morning I hear the fishing boats coming up the river. I can't get out of the habit of waking. In my mind I can see the sails, dark against the red sun, like what they used to be like, coming quietly out of the morning mist. Beautiful they was, just beautiful. You've got to have seen them sailing boats to know what a lovely sight it was. Now I listen to the engines. I can tell you by the sound if it's an oyster smack or a mackerel trawler. I can even tell you how many deep sea vessels from the Atlantic come in. Oh, it'll be good to be back at Billingsgate. Peggy and I agreed that it wouldn't be long. He was getting on famously. Peggy never left his side except for essential household duties. She spent hours reading to him. Frank had never learnt to read fluently and could barely write. Book learn has never been my strong point, but Peg, she's the scholar. I love to hear her read. She's got a lovely voice. Peggy read about half a dozen of Dickens' novels in this way, sitting close to him, outwardly reading, but inwardly attentive to every mood and movement. She was conscious of every shade in her loved one, ready to close the book if she sensed tiredness, or to change his position if she saw discomfort. Peggy knew almost before he knew himself what his needs were going to be. Love permeated every nook and cranny of that little house. You could feel it as soon as you entered the front door, like a presence so tangible you could almost touch it. If there's one thing that a dying person needs more than relief from pain, it is love. Love prompted Peggy to sing to Frank every evening the old songs, the folk songs and hymns they had learnt in their childhood. Love prompted her to move the bed so he could see the masts and funnels of the boats as they approached the docks. They grew even closer. They had always been one flesh. Now they were one spirit, one soul. And all the time she kept up the pretense that he was going to recover. If she cried alone in the kitchen, he never saw it. The radium treatment halted the malignant growth for a while, but could not be continued beyond six weeks, as it would destroy other organs. Frank's deterioration was rapid when the treatment stopped. The pain became more intense, and the morphine was increased to one grain, then two grains every four hours. He could barely eat, and Peggy sat beside him, feeding semi-solids into his unwilling mouth. She washed and shaved him, dealt with his urine and his bowels, and kept him clean and comfortable, all the while humming the songs he liked. He no longer had the mental strength or interest to listen to Dickens, but he seemed to like to hear her singing. He rarely spoke and was drifting in and out of consciousness. Frank was quietly slipping away into that mysterious borderland between life and death, where peace and rest and gentle sounds are the only needs. One day, in my presence, he gazed at Peggy for a long time and then said quite clearly, Peggy, my first love, my only love, all was there, always, when I need you. He smiled and drifted away again. End of Disc 2 Shadows of the Workhouse, Disc 3 more than anything else, a dying person needs to have someone with them. This used to be recognised in hospitals, and when I trained, no one ever died alone. However busy the wards, or however short of staff, a nurse was always assigned to sit with a dying person and hold their hand, whisper a few words. Peace and quietness, even reverence for the dying, were expected and assured. 
I disagree wholly with the notion that there is no point in staying with an unconscious patient because he or she does not know you are there. I am perfectly certain through years of experience and observation that unconsciousness, as we define it, is not a state of unknowing. Rather, it is a state of knowing and understanding on a different level that is beyond our immediate experience. The last evening of Frank's life came surprisingly quickly. Rash is the professional who will predict death. The young can die while your back is turned. Yet the old and frail, who you think will die in the night, live on for weeks. The late summer evening was beautiful as I approached the prefab estate. Long shafts of sunlight glimmered on the river and made the little buildings glow like pink marble. Peggy greeted me at the door with the words, He's changed, nurse. About an hour ago he's just changed. Something's different. She was right. A deep, motionless stupor had come over Frank. He did not appear to be in any discomfort or distress. In fact, I have never in all my experience known anyone to die in a state of distress. Death agony is a common idea, but I have never seen it. Frank's breathing had changed. It was very slow and deep. I counted the breaths, and there were only six per minute. He was slightly blue around the mouth, nose, and ears. His eyes were open but unseeing. Peggy took his hand and grasped it firmly. She stroked his forehead with her other hand and leaned over him, whispering, I'm here, Frank. It's all right, my love. I'm here. He seemed quite unconscious, but I saw his hand move as he gripped hers more firmly. What is this mystery we call the unconscious? I felt sure he knew she was there. Perhaps he could even hear her and understand her words. I felt his nose, his ears, his feet. They were quite cold. I felt his pulse. It was only twenty beats per minute. I whispered, I'll stay here quietly. I'll sit over by the window. She nodded. I sat down to contemplate them both. She was completely calm and relaxed. She did not look unhappy or even anxious. Every nerve of her concentration was focused on the dying man. She was with him in death as she had been in life. His breathing rate dropped to four per minute, and the hand holding Peggy's fell limp. I felt his pulse again, but could not locate it, and when I did it was a feeble eight or ten beats per minute. I sat down again, and Peggy continued to stroke his face and his hands. The clock ticked steadily, and quarter of an hour elapsed. Frank gave a deep, deep breath, which made a rasping sound as it passed through the collapsed throat muscles. A little fluid oozed out of his mouth. His eyes were still open, but a white film was collecting over them. Peggy whispered, I think he's gone. I think so. But wait quietly for a minute. She sat unmoving by the inert body for about two minutes. Then to our surprise, he took another huge rasping breath. Would there be another? We waited for a full five minutes, but he did not breathe again. There was no pulse or heartbeat. Spontaneously, Peggy said, Into thy hands, O Lord, I commend his spirit. Then she recited the Lord's Prayer, in which I joined her. Together, we straightened and laid out the dead man's body. We closed his eyes. We had to change the bed linen completely because at the time of dying, his bowels and bladder had emptied. We washed him, and I said, we will leave him in a shirt put on back to front. The undertakers will bring a shroud. She replied, I've got one. I got it several weeks ago. I couldn't have left him indecent, could I? 
She fetched a chair and climbed up to a small cupboard high above the gas meter. There was a box in it from which she extracted a shroud. We put it on him. I asked her if she would like me to contact the undertakers. She thanked me and said she would be grateful. But tell them not to come till tomorrow morning, will you, please? That was perfectly normal. In those days, the deceased often lay in the house for a day or two as a mark of respect for the dead. Family and neighbours would come in to pay their respects. Throughout, Peggy was completely calm and tranquil. Her face and voice betrayed no sign of sorrow or loss. In fact, I would have said she had an almost ethereal quality about her. I left her with a feeling of admiration. At the door, she said, If you see any neighbours, don't tell them Frank's died, will you? I'll tell them tomorrow. I want to tell them myself. Of course not, I reassured her, although I would have to report it at Nanata's house. Oh, that's all right. It's just the neighbours. I don't want them to know yet. They can come tomorrow to pay their respects, but not tonight. We smiled at each other and I squeezed her hand. No one would come barging in tonight, not the undertakers, nor the neighbours, nor anyone. She could be alone with her thoughts and her memories. Would she like a couple of sleeping tablets? She thought for a second. Yes, that would be a very good idea. I opened my bag and handed her a couple of sonoril. Peggy shut and locked the door when I left. She sat for many hours on the edge of the bed, unable to take her eyes off Frank, their life together tumbling through her mind. Her happiness had been perfect and complete. She had always known that. And now she was not going to be parted from him. She climbed again to the cupboard above the gas meter and took out two more boxes. She undressed and brushed her hair. She opened the larger of the two boxes and took out a white shroud, which she put on, tying the ribbons carefully at the back. She opened the small box and tipped out fifteen grains of morphine, to which she added the two sonoral. She took a bottle of brandy and a glass from the bedside cabinet and swallowed all the tablets in two or three gulps. She continued drinking brandy until she could no longer sit up. When the undertakers arrived the next morning, they could not get in. They broke the window and saw her dead, her arms around her brother. Sister Julienne and I left Nanata's house and cycled towards the tenements known as the Canada Buildings. We made our way to Alberta House to a patient I had not met before, a man with leg ulcers that required daily dressing. Sister had told me the ulcers were severe and warned that dressing such wounds in the patient's home was very different from doing so in a surgically equipped and sterile hospital. The man was a Mr. Joseph Collett, aged over 80, and he lived alone in one of the ground floor flats. We knocked and in time the door was opened by a very old and rather dirty man. He peered at us through thick lens glasses, and it was obvious that he could not see at all well. Nonetheless, he must have recognised us, for he opened the door wide, drew himself up very straight, and bowed slightly, saying, Morning, sister. I've been expecting you. It's good of you to come. Who have you got with you today? Someone new? This is Nurse Lee, and when I have shown her the routine, she will be looking after you. He turned to me. Oh, it's nice to have you here, young lady. I'm sure we're going to get on famous. Allow me, sister. With old world courtesy, he took her bag and slowly walked with it to the table. I've got the boiling water ready and the flavine. And lint. I think you'll find everything's there. Sister Julienne started unpacking her bag, and I looked around the room. The smell was not too pleasant. 
but I had got used to that in the tenements. The walls were a dirty beige with peeling wallpaper. The paint was dark brown, blistered and cracking. A small gas stove sat in one corner by the stone sink. Next to the sink was a lavatory, an obvious addition to the room. The windows were so dirty that very little light could penetrate and there were no curtains. An open doorway revealed the bedroom with a brass bedstead. The whole area, living room, bedroom, kitchen and lavatory, could not have been more than about 18 feet square and there was no bathroom. It was adequate for an old man living alone, but I knew that many such tenement flats housed whole families. How did they manage and stay sane? A fire was burning merrily in the hearth, and a hod of coal stood beside it. I noticed a tin bath full of coal under the sink. A very beautiful grandfather clock stood proudly against the opposite wall, next to a large wooden crate full of sticks and old newspapers. A heavy wooden table, the sort antique dealers would fight over today, filled the centre of the room, and some grimy plates and mugs were spread out on a newspaper. The room was full of old military photographs, prints and maps yellowed with age and dirt. I concluded that Mr Collett had been a soldier. Our patient sat down in a high wooden chair next to the fire, took his slippers off, and placed his right foot on a low stool. He pulled up his trouser leg, revealing horrible blood and pus-soaked bandages. Sister Julienne told me to do the dressing whilst she watched me. I knew everything had to be disposed of in the patient's house, so I placed newspapers on the wooden floor. I kneeled down and started to undo the bandages with forceps. The stench was revolting and I felt nausea rising as I struggled to peel off the layers of bandage which were stuck to each other with slimy fluid. I let them fall onto the newspaper to be burned on the fire. The ulcer was the worst I had ever seen, extending upwards from the ankle for about six to eight inches. It was deep and suppurating badly. I cleaned it with saline, packed the cavities with gauze soaked in flavine, and rebandaged. Then the other leg had to be treated. Mr. Collett didn't complain, but sat back sucking an old pipe with no tobacco in it, talking now and then to Sister Julienne. The grandfather clock ticked loudly. The fire crackled and blazed. The siren of a cargo boat echoed through the room as I completed the second dressing, with the quiet satisfaction of knowing that I had made this dignified old soldier more comfortable. I cleaned up, saw that everything was burned, packed my bag, and Sister and I prepared to leave. Won't you stay for a cup of tea, Sister? he asked. It won't take me a minute. No, but thank you, we have other work to do. I thought he looked crestfallen, but he said quickly, Oh, then I won't keep you, ma'am. This old-fashioned use of the royal ma'am surprised me, but strangely it didn't sound out of place. Nurse Lee will come to you each morning from now on. He laid his pipe on the mantelpiece and stood up. He was very tall, more than six feet, and stood very straight. He walked slowly over to the door and opened it for us then bowed again slightly as we left. Inevitably, if you see a person daily in his own home over several months, you will cease to regard him as a patient and come to know him as a person. Treating Mr. Collett's leg ulcers took about half an hour, during which time we talked, and as old people can always remember the distant past more easily than they can remember yesterday, we talked about his early life. Mr. Collett was not a typical Cockney in appearance, speech or manner. He was much taller than average and had a slow, thoughtful way about him. His quiet dignity and formal way of speaking commanded respect and I never presumed to call him Joe. He was a Londoner, first generation, and spoke with a London accent, but it was not heavy Cockney. 
He told me his parents were country people from Sussex who had been tenant farmers. The family had been displaced by the Enclosure Acts of the 19th century, and, unable to sustain themselves even at subsistence level, they had drifted towards the city in search of work. They had settled in Croydon, where Mr. Collett had been born in the 1870s, the oldest of eight children. His father had been a painter and decorator, and an unskilled builder's labourer. He was often out of work, because in the 19th century painting was a trade at the mercy of the weather. Paints had no chemical, quick-drying components in them, and would take about four days to dry, so in wet weather no painting could be done externally, and the men were laid off. The building trade was in the same position, because cement would not dry in less than three days. But my father was a good man, said Mr. Collett. He would not see his wife and children go without. There was always stone breaking to be done for road building and railway construction, and he would go to the yards and break stones all day. He would come home at night, wet through, aching all over, with a few pence in his pocket, and my mother would rub his back and chest with liniment, and apply flannel soaked in hot mustard water to keep out the cold. He was a good man. He wouldn't go to the pub and drink away his money like many. Mr. Collett shook his head in disapproval and cut off a chunk of tobacco, which he proceeded to shred in the palm of his gnarled hand and stuff into a leather pouch in which he kept a piece of apple peel to keep the tobacco moist, he told me. I was fascinated by this tobacco called shag or twist, which was sold in lengths. Shag was the tobacco my grandfather smoked, and the smell of it filled me with happy childhood memories. Tobacconists kept long coils of it, perhaps two or three feet long, like a curled black sausage, and a few inches would be sawn off and sold to a customer. Mr. Collett always asked me to join him in a cup of tea, and I always refused, for two reasons. I had never been able to drink strong tea, the unvarying brew of East Londoners, but more importantly, the thought of drinking anything from those filthy mugs I saw on the table made me feel sick. Neither of these reasons could I tell him, so I always said I was too busy. He accepted this, but he always looked sad, and once he just nodded his head quietly and swallowed hard, as though there was a lump in his throat. There was a patient weariness and sorrow written all over his strong features, which made me think he was lonely, and that my visit was the bright spot of his day. I didn't like to leave him, even though it was always a relief to quit the all-pervading smell of the place. Then I had a brilliant idea. Boiling water poured into those filthy mugs would melt the grease and accumulated dirt, which would then float to the top. If I asked for a cold drink, the dirt would remain stuck to the sides of the mug. So I said I didn't like hot drinks, but would enjoy something cold. I was thinking of orange juice. His face burst into smiles, like the sun coming out on a grey day. That's what you shall have, my maiden. He went to a small cupboard near the sink and came out with two hand-cut crystal glasses and a bottle of sherry. Oh, no, no, I protested. I can't drink alcohol, not when I'm on duty. I meant orange squash or something. His face fell. The sun went behind the clouds. I realised how much it meant to him and how little it meant to me. The scales are unevenly balanced, I thought. I laughed and said, All right, I'll just have half a glass. But don't you dare tell the sisters or I shall get the sack. No nurse is ever allowed to drink on duty. I sat down on the kitchen chair by the big mahogany table, and we drank a glass of sherry together, sharing the secret of my disobeying orders. The light was dim because of the dirty windows, but the fire glowed red, transforming the squalor into coziness. Mr. Collett's eyes gleamed with pleasure. 
That moment was significant in my life, because I understood that he had wanted to give me something, but had not known how. A cup of tea was all he could think of. My refusal had been a rebuff. By joining him in a clandestine glass of sherry, we had shared more than just the drink. We had shared a conspiracy of silence. It obviously meant more to him than I could have imagined, and I felt all my youthful pride and arrogance crumbling to dust beside his humble, unaffected joy in my company. That day was the beginning of a friendship that was to last until his death. The next day a bottle of orange juice was standing on Mr. Collett's table. Bless him, I thought. I asked him to tell me more about his early life in Croydon and about his family. It was a good life for children. Back then, Croydon was a small place in the countryside. There were fields and farmhouses and streams where the children played. We were poor, but not as poor as many. My mother was always a good manager, and my father kept an allotment, so we always had fresh vegetables. But it all came to a tragic end. He paused and filled his pipe. I bandaged up his first leg and started the second. What happened? My father died. The scaffolding on the building where he was working collapsed. Five men were killed. It was due to slipshod workmanship on the part of the scaffold builders. There was no compensation for the wives and children of the dead men. My mother could not pay the rent and we had to get out of the house. He sucked on his pipe and clouds of smoke filled the room. I don't like to remember where we moved to, but it was smaller and cheaper. We kept on moving to smaller and smaller places. I was thirteen and the eldest. I left school and tried to get work, but in 1890 there was no work. He had tramped for miles trying to find anything, on the land, on building sites, with horses, on the railways, but there was nothing. The only job I could get was in the yard where my father used to break stones in the bad weather, but it was piecework and I wasn't really old enough or strong enough to break the granite boulders. I hardly got a thing for a day's hard labour. I remember my mother cried when she saw me at the end of the day. She said, you are not going to do this, my son. I'm not going to have you die as well. The men were rough, you know, really rough. And they were all swinging fifteen-pound sledgehammers. Most of them were drunk. You can imagine the accident if a lad of thirteen had been hit instead of a stone. I undid the second bandage. So what did the family do? I asked. We came up to London. I don't know why. Perhaps my mother was told there was more chance of work. We came here to Alberta Buildings. I can still see the old flat from here. That one on the fifth floor, second from the end by the stairway. It was just one room, like this one, but with no water or lavatory, of course. I think there was gaslight when we could afford to use it. It was cheap, but even at three and sixpence a week, my mother had to work day and night to keep a roof over our heads. From the day my father died, my mother never stopped working. With the childhood memories flooding back to him, Mr. Collett described how his mother did cleaning by day, portering, and took in washing and ironing. There were good wash houses at Alberta Buildings in those days, he said. On top of that, she took in mending for the second-hand clothes dealers, did umbrella stitching in the winter and parasol making in summer. She had applied to the poor board for relief, but was told she was not of the parish and to go back where she came from. As a special concession, the chairman had offered to take three of her children to be put in the workhouse, then she would only have five children left to feed. When his mother refused, they had called her ungrateful and improvident and said she would have to manage as best she could. She did manage, 
but I don't know how. She kept a roof over our heads and provided enough food to keep us from starving. But we seldom had a fire, even in the coldest weather. We never had shoes, and our clothes were mostly in rags. All the families around us were just as poor, and it was made far worse by drunkenness. Most of the men drank, and that meant a lot of violence in some of the homes. Many women were in such despair they drowned themselves. Every week the cry would go up, a body in the cuts, and it was always a woman. You can imagine how the children felt, always scared their mother might be next. He sat thinking for a while, puffing his pipe, and then chuckled. It's a funny thing, you know, but children can accept almost anything when they feel loved and secure. In spite of being cold and hungry, my brothers and sisters were always laughing, always playing out in the court. I never heard any of them complain, but I was different. I was thirteen and I hated seeing my dear mother working eighteen or twenty hours a day for a pittance. She would sit late into the night sewing shirts by candlelight in a freezing room with no food inside her or for sixpence. I resented the injustice of it. Of course, I was out each day looking for work, but times were hard, and the best I could find were odd jobs. I tried to get work in the docks. There was plenty of work in London, Stocklands, but there were thousands and thousands of men after it. I reckon there were ten men for every job. No chance for a young boy like me. In those days, jobs went mostly to the boys whose fathers and grandfathers had been dockers, Mr Collett explained. There were frightening scenes at the dock gates, hundreds of half-starved labourers clad in rags, desperate, fighting for the chance of a few hours' work. Perhaps fifty would be taken on for the day, while five hundred would be turned away. At low tide, there was always scavenging to be done in the mud. Some lads found things of value, but I never did. The best thing I found was bits of coal washed off the barges and driftwood. At least that made a fire for the evening. The worst thing was the way the gentry were so suspicious. I was looking for honest work, but I was called ragamuffin, varmin, lout, thieving dog. Just because I was thin and ill-clothed and looking hungry, they assumed I was a thief. Mr. Collett's mouth tightened, his proud face stiffened at the memory of the insults. I had finished his second leg and sat back on my heels looking up at him, thinking that the accumulated experience of age was much more interesting than the chatter of the young. I had a glass of orange juice while he drank a cup of tea. It was a good compromise because he gave me a glass, which was dusty, but not filthy. I was enjoying his company and conversation and didn't want to leave him, as he seemed so happy. On impulse, I said, I must go now, but it's my evening off tonight. Can I come and have a glass of sherry with you, and you can continue your stories? The joy on his face answered my question. Can you come, my maiden? Can you come? I'll say you can come, and a thousand times welcome. I cycled round to Alberta Buildings at about 8pm with a light heart. Mr Collett was so obviously overjoyed to see me that he seemed nervous. He had gone some trouble, put on a clean shirt and waistcoat and a pair of highly polished boots. The whole room smelled strongly of boot polish. The dirty plates and mugs and newspapers had been removed from the table, and two fine crystal glasses and half a bottle of sherry had been put out in readiness. The fire burned brightly, casting flickering shadows over the dingy walls. He walked slowly and carefully over to his chair. Oh, it's good to have you here. Sit down. It's so nice to see you. I was overwhelmed and a bit embarrassed by all this, and sat down awkwardly, not knowing quite what to say. 
You've come. You're here, he repeated. Oh, this is so lovely. Obviously, I had to say something. Yes, I've come. Of course I have. So let's have a glass of sherry and we can talk about old times. He laughed with delight and went over to the table and lifted the bottle. He felt around for the glasses and I moved to help him, but he said, No, no, I can do it. I have to do it all the time, you know. He poured out two glasses. His hand shook a little and he spilled a considerable quantity on the table, of which he was unaware. I took a sip of the sherry. Mmm, lovely. Oh, this is a cosy room and you know how to make a nice fire. He settled down comfortably in his wooden chair and put his feet on the stool. Ulcerated legs have to be kept raised as much as possible. He pulled out his shag and his penknife and started cutting it up. I inhaled a sniff of the strong tobacco. Oh, this is luxury. When I was young, I would never have dreamed of such luxury. A fire every day, a warm bed at night enough food to eat, a welfare state that pays my rent because I'm too old to work and pays me a pension of ten shillings and sixpence a week to buy all that I need, including a bottle of sherry when I want it. This is luxury my poor dear mother never knew in all her life. He filled his pipe, took a wooden spill from a pot at his side and stuck it into the fire. When it burned up brightly, he brought it up to his pipe, sucking hard so the flame dipped downwards into the tobacco. He puffed contentedly, and smoke filled the air. Then he blew the flame out and returned the half-burned spill to the pot in much the same way that my grandfather used to do. Oh, sheer luxury, he said, smiling contentedly. I was telling you about our first years in Poplar after my father died and how I couldn't find work. Well, there was one job I got that was good fun for a lad looking for adventure. I was down the black wall steps waiting for the tide to go out so I could go scavenging. And a man came along and he said to me, Here, boy, can you cook a stew? Yes, I said. I would have said yes to anything. Can you skin a rabbit? Yes, sir. Bone a fish? Yes, sir. Make tea and cocoa? Yes, sir. Clean a wick, fill a lamp? Yes, sir. Well, you're the boy I want. My cabin boy's done a bunk. Can you sail today? Anywhere, sir. Be here at high tide. The British lions, the barge you want, a florin a week, all found. It was all so quick, I hadn't time to draw breath. I raced back to the Alberta buildings, round to the wash house where my mother was toiling away, and told her I'd been hired as a cabin boy on a Thames barge. My mother didn't look as thrilled as I had expected. In fact, she was dead against it. We had words and I shouted at her. Look, I'm off, whatever you say, and I'll come back a rich man, you'll see. So I ran to the steps and sure enough, at high tide, the British lion came along and I jumped aboard. Oh, it was the most wonderful time and I reckon every boy's dream. I was on the river for six months. The barge carried flints, coal, wood, bricks, sand, slates, anything. We would take a load of coal down to Kent and pick up a cargo of bricks to bring back to Limehouse. In those days, hundreds of trading vessels plied the river. Huge ocean-going cargo boats down to one man skiffs. You could always tell a barge by the red sail and often the sail and the cabin were all that could be seen. The barges were so low that with a full load the whole deck would be under water. It's true. He heard my incredulous gasp and roared with laughter. People would stare from the banks because, honestly, all they could see was a red sail and men paddling about knee-deep in water 
with apparently nothing between them. Oh, I was as happy as a boy could be, he continued with another laugh. I made the stews, trimmed the lamps, learned boat handling, and I didn't mind I wasn't paid. The skipper always said he would pay me after the next trip. After a bit, the mate whispered to me, Oh, that bloody monkey's not gonna pay you, he never does. All the cabin boys do a bunk in the end. Oh, that was a shock to me, that was. I had been counting up the florins in my mind and I'd reckoned on one pound after working ten weeks and two pounds after twenty weeks. I thought I was rich, except that I hadn't got the money. So I asked the skipper and he said, Oh, after the next trip, lad, when I'm in funds. Well, the next trip came and went and no money. Three or four more trips, no money. I got cross and resentful and told him if he didn't pay me, I'd do a bunk. But he just smiled pleasantly and said, After the next trip, Joe, the next trip, trust me. Well, of course I knew he wouldn't pay me. And the next time we reached Limehouse, I left the barge and didn't go back. He paused and sucked on his pipe. If I'd known what I was doing... I don't think I would have left the barge, pay or no pay. You see, I was happy and busy, which is what a boy needs. The skipper and his mate were nice men. We got on all right. I had enough food to eat and a bunk to sleep on. What more can you ask in life? What does money matter? The trouble was the skipper had hired me for a florin a week, so I was expecting it. If he'd asked me in the first place to join him to learn boatmanship and navigation, with no pay while I was learning, I would have accepted, and my mother would have been pleased. But he lied to me, and that was his mistake. And my misfortune. Joe had left fully expecting to find a similar job on another barge, but there were no jobs. The other barges supported just a skipper and a mate, but no cabin boy because skippers could not afford to pay a boy. The British Lion only had the luxury of a boy because he was never paid. After six months on the river, Joe was tanned and strong from long hours of work in the fresh air. He had grown taller and filled out with good food inside him. The dense population of Poplar, the stuffy buildings and crowded streets suffocated him. Food was scarce, and he grew pale and thin again. On the barge he had held himself upright, and his eyes had sparkled with the pride of his position as a cabin boy. Returning to the streets of Poplar, he slouched, his eyes dull and downcast. Worst of all was his state of mind, as it dawned upon him that he was one of the myriad flotsam drifting around the docklands, unwashed, underfed ill-clothed, barely educated, with no realistic hope of anything better. He was fifteen. His poor mother worried about him naturally. It had been a joy to see him fit after six months on the barge. But as the months passed and she saw the degrading effects of poverty and unemployment biting deep, her worries increased. Furthermore, she now had to feed him. She earned her money mainly from washing. The two eldest girls had left school and worked in a shirt-making factory. Joe knew that he was fed on sweated female labour, and his proud young heart rebelled at the knowledge. At thirteen he had seen himself taking his father's role and supporting the family. Now, two years later, he had to acknowledge that he had provided nothing, and he was a burden on the female wage earners. It was when I was at my lowest that I met the recruiting sergeant, he said. At that moment, the grandfather clock sounded the quarter hour. What time is that? Quarter past ten? No, quarter past eleven. Eleven? It can't be. Oh, how time flies when you're enjoying yourself. I've talked far too much, and you must go, my maid. You've got a day's work to do tomorrow, and you need your beauty sleep. 
I was fascinated by his story. I hadn't enjoyed myself so much in ages. But nonetheless, I did have to go. As I stood up, I was surprised to see that a large area of the chimney breast above the fireplace was black, about two feet in an irregular circular shape. In addition, it seemed to be moving or shimmering like oil on a damp surface. I had not noticed this earlier, and curiosity compelled me to take a couple of steps nearer to see what it was. I saw and recoiled with horror, my hand over my mouth to prevent a scream escaping. The moving mass was thousands of bugs. I had heard that Alberta Buildings was infested with house bugs, but had not seen them before. They were behind the plaster, infesting every level and every flat. They came out at night, attracted by the heat, and it was impossible to get rid of them. Only with the demolition of the Canada buildings a few years later were the bugs destroyed. I stood rooted to the spot, my eyes darting around the room, feeling these vile creatures were everywhere. I imagined I was itching. Mr. Collett could see neither the bugs on the wall nor the expression on my face, which was just as well. He rose, smiling, and held out his hand to say goodbye. Outside I shuddered, as much from shock as from the cold air. I got on my bike and rode back to Nanata's house. A hot bath was the only thing on my mind. Bugs crawled through my dreams during half the night and seriously disturbed my sleep. At breakfast I sat at the large pine table in the kitchen, pale and heavy-eyed, picking up my cornflakes. What the hell's the matter with you? said Trixie sharply. I thought you'd been seeing old man of eighty last night. Oh, did we get it wrong? Is he eighteen? Oh, shut up, you cynical cat, I muttered crossly, and told the girls about the bugs. They gasped with horror, and Trixie, being the most affected, threatened to strangle me if I said another word. Cynthia gazed at me in sympathy, and Chummy said, Great Jehoshaphat, how perfectly ghastly. At that moment, the sisters entered the kitchen and wanted to know what was so ghastly. I gave a graphic account dwelling on the vast number of bugs and my sleepless night. If I had expected cries for sympathy and horror, I was to be disappointed. Sister Evangelina humphed. Well, there are bugs in all the tenements. I'm surprised you haven't seen them before. Don't make a fuss, they won't hurt you. And Sister Bernadette added, I was delivering a baby one night by gaslight, and I looked up, and the gas mantle had a circle of black round it, just as you described. This was on the wall over the woman's bed. Sister Julienne, who had kept her hand firmly over her mouth to prevent herself from laughing, I suspected, said, it's a bit of a shock to us all when we first see them. You have to understand that they live in buildings and do not infest human beings. As for your never going back there, I'm afraid that is out of the question. You are going back there this morning to treat Mr. Collett's legs. With that, she left the kitchen to start her morning's work. I clenched my teeth. Sister Julienne was as firm as she was saintly, and I had no choice but to go back. I realised I would have to take a grip of myself. Cynthia's next words were unexpected. Oh, now, come off it. It isn't like you to get so worked up. If bugs are in all the tenements, we must work with them all the time, only we don't see them. Out of sight, out of mind. Now forget about it. You will probably never see them again. I knew she was right. Her slow, gentle grin put everything into perspective and we laughed together as we got our bikes out. District work tends to blow the cobwebs away. Mr. Collett was smiling and happy when he opened the door. Welcome, my lassie, and I hope you had a good night's sleep. Yesterday evening was the happiest time I've had for ages. I didn't tell him that I had been awake half the night, and I didn't like to think of the hurt he would have suffered if I had never come back. As I undid the bandage, I remarked, These ulcers are improving. 
Why did you not have regular treatment before? Well, I didn't like to bother anyone. I've had them for years and always bandaged them myself. I had to see the doctor about my eyes and he saw I was limping a bit and asked to see my legs. And then he arranged for you sisters to come. I didn't ask for treatment. I never thought they were bad enough. They were the worst leg ulcers I had seen and he didn't think they were bad enough to justify a nurse's treatment. I asked him how they had started. It was gun wounds during the war. They healed up all right, but there was always a weakness. As I got older, the little patches started and then spread. But I can't grumble. You expect these little things as you get old. Little things, I thought. I wouldn't call these ulcers little. The mention of gun wounds made me think of the recruiting sergeant who had been driven from my mind by the bugs. Last night you said you met the recruiting sergeant. He settled back comfortably in his chair. That morning he began a story that he continued in subsequent visits, often over sherry in the evening. Well, I was fifteen, and I reckon if I hadn't met him, it would have been a life of crime for me. There was no work, and I'd met a lad who was into everything. He always seemed to have money. He was younger than me, but quicker and smarter. We palled up together. I'm not going to tell you what we did, because I'm not proud of it. But one day, he suggested going up the West End, where the pickings would be better. I'd never been up West before. I remember feeling dazzled by the great buildings, the fine open streets, all the carriages and ladies and gentlemen in their fine clothes. We went to Trafalgar Square, and my eyes were popping out, especially at the sight of the soldiers in their crimson jackets and black trousers. And one of them came over to where we were standing by a fountain. I was so flattered, I couldn't believe he wanted to talk to us. He chuckled and blew a cloud of smoke across the room. I thought it was a special honour. No one had told me they were at it every day, on the lookout for lads like me. Now then, now then, my fine young man, he was talking to me, not to my mate. Ain't a fine young man like you got nothing to do on a day like this? I must have shrugged and grinned sheepishly. Well then... Did you ever see a soldier with nothing to do? Well, I hadn't, but then I had never seen soldiers before, and I was struck dumb with the honour of having this splendid figure of a man single me out for conversation. Then he asked me what I'd had for breakfast. Nothing, I said. Nothing, he roared. Nothing? Well, I've never heard of nothing like it. Did you say nothing? I nodded. No wonder you're looking a bit skinny, begging your pardon for the liberty, squire, but one can't help noticing these things. Look at me now, and he patted a well-filled stomach. Bacon and liver and brawn and kidneys with fresh eggs and filled mushrooms, as much bread and dripping as a man can eat, with beer, if your taste runs to beer at breakfast, or tea and coffee with fresh cream and sugar from Barbados. That's the sort of breakfast a man needs to line his stomach for the day. And did you tell me you had nothing? That is unbelievable, unbelievable. <laughs> he shook his head as though he had never heard anything like it before. Well, now, young man, you come along with me. A friend of mine runs an alehouse over there. As a favour to me, I'm sure he can find you something to fill your stomach. He's got a kind heart, he has, and when I tells him that my friend, if I can make so bold as to call you my friend, has had no breakfast, it will fair melt his tender old heart, it will. No, not you, he said to my mate, who had edged forward at the mention of breakfast. He put his hand on my shoulder and led me to the alehouse. It was dark and smoky inside, and after the sunlight I couldn't see anything. But the soldier led me to a table and sat me down. Bill, he roared, Bill, does a man have to wait all day for a pint of water? Look lively, man. 
the fat, well-fed figure of the landlord emerged from the gloom. A pint of your best for me and my friend. Why, bless my soul, can you believe it? I don't even know your name. I felt so comfortable with you like I've known you all my life, but I don't even know your name. I'm Joe Collett. Joe, what a coincidence. My young brother's called Joe, and a tall, handsome man he is just like you. Oh, what a lad he is. My brother Joe, such larks. Remember the larks we've had in here with Joe, eh, Bill? Those were the days. My young brother Joe joined the dragoons, and now he's a commanding officer, with a servant and carriage, and as much money as he knows how to spend. But I was forgetting. Now, Bill, my old mate, my young friend Joe has had a bit of a night of it, and has unfortunately missed his breakfast. The landlord sounded astonished. Missed his breakfast? A man can't get through the day without a good breakfast to warm him. That's terrible, that is. He patted his large belly and looked at me with a sympathetic face. The sergeant winked suggestively. There, I knew as how you'd see the gravity of the situation, Bill. I says to young Joe, my mate, Bill, he'll see you all right. Now, what have you got out the back there that would satisfy young Joe? Nothing too flash, like, cos he ain't got much money on him at present. I was alarmed. I hadn't got any money. But before I could speak, the landlord said, Call it on the house, Sarge, on the house. It's an honour to entertain a guardsman any time, and any friend of yours is a friend of mine. Now, young sir, would try it and faggots and a good chunk of last night's peas pudding, fried up crispy-like, suit you? I couldn't believe my luck. It sounded like a meal fit for a king. Oh, and do you like bread and dripping, young sir? I loved bread and dripping. The meal arrived, and it was enough for two kings. I just ate and ate. The sergeant didn't say anything. He just smoked his pipe and drank his porter and looked out of the window at the pigeons squabbling on the window sill. When I'd finished, he said, mm, You were hungry, squire. I nodded and thanked him warmly. Don't thank me, lad. You heard what the landlord said. It's an honour to entertain a guardsman. We gets that all the time, we do. We gets used to it. Treated like royalty we are wherever we go. No one can do enough for us. Did you ever see a soldier go hungry? Course not. He puffed his pipe and called for another pint of porter, saying confidentially, Between ourselves, the ale in this house is real special. Old Bill brews it himself. If you are a connoisseur, good ales, young squire, and I'm sure you are, I don't think you will be disappointed. Unless, of course, you prefer coffee after breakfast. What a suggestion to a fifteen-year-old going on sixteen. Bill brought two pints of porter, and I began to confide in the sergeant. I told him my father was dead. Oh, your poor mother, said the sergeant huskily, pulling out a handkerchief. My father died when I was a young lad, much younger than you, of course. I was sixteen when my father died, and my poor mother had a life of hard, hard work in order to keep us, and he blew his nose and dabbed his eyes. What would a man do without his mother? She sacrifices everything to bring up her family and does without herself. A man can't do enough to repay his mother, he can't. My mother settled comfortably in a nice little cottage in the country, which me and my brother Joe got her with our army pay. Here, Bill, more ale and look lively. Did you say a cottage in the country? He nodded. Yes, was the least we could do for our poor old mum. My brother Joe and me is a good lad, he is. We saves up our army pay, and now she lives like a princess, our old mother does, wants for nothing. I thought of my mother, sitting up half the night, mending for a rascally second-hand clothes dealer, going out at five in the morning to clean offices, and then toiling all day over the wash tub. I said, how do you get into the army? 
He looked surprised and raised his eyebrows. Oh, was you thinking of an army career then? I nodded, but how do you get in? He drew his chair closer to mine and lowered his voice. Oh, it's not easy, I can tell you that for a start. It's not what you knows, but who you knows, as the saying goes. It's a lucky day for you, Squire, that you met me, because I've taken a real fancy to you, seeing as you are like my young brother, Joe. How old are you, Joe? Seventeen? Eighteen, eh? Well, Seventeen, I said. It was a lie, I was fifteen. I thought as much. Good judge of age, I am. It's lucky for you you are seventeen, because you couldn't get into the army if you was only sixteen. He leaned closer. Is your health good? No, nasties. I said my health was good. Are you a Christian? The army won't have none of them heathens or atheists. I said I was Church of England. Now, you're an intelligent lad, I can see that. Can you write your name? I said I had been at school full time until I was thirteen. A scholar, my word! With your edification, sir, you will rise to the rank of Brigadier General, you will. He stretched out his hand, took my porter from me, and drank it himself. If you are going to put pen to paper, young sir, you will need a steady hand. It's your lucky day, lad. I knows where the recruiting office is situated. And if I recommends you to the company's commanding officer, I'm very well thought of in higher command, I am. I reckons you would be in with a chance. Come on, let's go. Out in the sunlight I blinked and lowered my head from the glare, but the sergeant turned to me. Right now, guardsman, call it, stand up straight. Throw your head and your shoulders back. Breathe deep, chest out. The soldiers of the Queen don't slouch around the place. Now, pick your feet up. Left, right, left, right, left, right. Eyes straight ahead. Left, right. We marched across the square at a cracking speed. People fell aside. Everyone looked at us. I felt so proud. We passed my mate, who just gawped. We entered the recruiting office, and the sergeant snapped his heels together with a crack like a whip and shot his arm up in salute to the officer. Sir, Mr. Joseph Collett, sir, age 17, good health, good education, father dead, sir, wants to be a soldier, sir. Highly recommended, sir. There was a lot of saluting and sighing and eel snapping, and the sergeant said, Right, young Joe, I'll leave you with the commanding officer. I'll be off now. Good luck, lad. And I never saw him again. With bewildering speed, Joe had been hustled into the medical room. A doctor gave him a quick look over and passed him as fit. He was taken to a desk and told to write his name and address at the top of the printed form, then to sign his name at the end of the page. Joe did so. Guardsman Collett, you are now a soldier in Her Majesty's Scots Guards. You will receive full uniform, full rations, full billeting and a shilling a day. Here is a travel warrant to take you from Waterloo to Aldershot, which will be your first camp. You may go home now and tell your mother and collect your personal belongings. The last train from Waterloo goes at 10pm. If you are not on it, remember, you are now a fully enlisted guardsman and failure to report at barracks will be counted as desertion, which is punishable by a flogging and six months in prison on bread and water. Here is your first day's pay of one shilling. Now follow the uniform sergeant downstairs where you will be fitted with boots and uniform. Stand to attention, guardsman Collett, and salute when you are leaving a superior officer. Joe looked exceedingly handsome in the scarlet jacket and black trousers, and he gazed at his reflection with barely suppressed joy. He put the shilling and his travel warrant in his pocket. He was given a parcel containing his old clothes, directions to Waterloo Station, and with dire warnings about prison and flogging if he failed to turn up, was sent on his way. Joe marched all the way back to Poplar, his newly acquired military swagger getting stronger with every step. His buttons gleamed, his boots shone, his red tunic dazzled the eye. People stood aside. Older men touched their caps. 
Small boys marched beside him, imitating his step. Best of all, young girls giggled and whispered and tried to attract his attention. But his eyes straight ahead, as ordered by the recruiting sergeant, was Joe's rule, and never once did he glance back, however enticing the female attentions. Girls had never looked at him before. A soldier's life is a life for me, and his young heart sang in tune to his step. He marched into the court of Alberta buildings, round to the wash house, and flung open the door. The chatter stopped, and a gasp of admiration went up from the women at the wash tubs. His mother gazed uncomprehendingly at the figure in the doorway for a few seconds, and then a moan escaped her lips, rising to a terrible scream, and she fainted. Joe rushed forward in alarm. Women crowded round. Water was splashed over his mother's face, and she opened her eyes, which, seeing Joe in his scarlet tunic, flooded with tears. She sobbed uncontrollably, unable to speak. A woman said, Oh, you best get her back to your place and old Joe. Poor soul. She's that took she can hardly stand, poor lamb. Oh, Joe, you didn't never ought to have done it. Alarmed and bewildered, Joe helped his mother across the cobbled court and up the stone stairway to their flat. A neighbour brought in a cup of tea. I've laced it with a drop of something soothing, Mrs Collett, to keep your strength up. Oh, Lord knows you're going to need it. And she gave Joe a reproachful stare. His mother drank the tea, and the sobs diminished. Joe asked her why she was crying. A soldier, Joe. My eldest son, my comfort, my hope, a soldier. They draw them in, young men, thousands of them every year. Cannon fodder, they call them, the scum of the earth. They draw them in to die. Tears again flooded her eyes, and she wiped them away with her shawl. Joe was not merely deflated. He was shattered. He had expected a hero's welcome. I had four older brothers, and they all died in the Crimean War, his mother said. I was only a little girl and hardly remember them, but I remember my mother crying and how she never recovered. The grief seemed to cling to her for the rest of her life. My older sister was engaged to be married to a young man who died at Sebastopol. The suffering was terrible by all accounts, just terrible. But the Crimean War was ages ago, Joe protested. It's all over and done with. The Empire's strong. There are no wars now. No one would dare attack the British Empire. And I am a soldier of the Queen Empress and proud of it. She forced a smile. Oh, you're a good lad, my son. And your mother's a silly old fusspot. She's not going to spoil your last afternoon with tears. When do you have to report to the barracks? He remembered the shilling in his tunic pocket. He pulled it out and laid it proudly on the table beside her. I'm paid a shilling a day, and it's all for you. I get my billet and my food and my uniform, so you won't want no more. Poor woman, she had cried all over again. Oh, my boy, oh, my lad. She kissed his hands and wiped her tears on his sleeve. My dear boy, but I fear for you. My heart is heavy. I fear for you. She pulled herself together. The children would soon be in from school, and later the girls from the factory. She couldn't present a tearful face to them. We'll use your shilling to buy some whelks and a loaf, and some real butter, and a saucer of jam for the little ones. We'll have a real feast your last evening at home. And that is exactly what they did. The younger boys were over the moon about their big brother's uniform. The sisters were agog with admiration. Suddenly Joe had become a man in their eyes. Time passed all too quickly. The laughter, the cheers, the songs had come to an end. 
Joe had a train to catch from Waterloo at ten o'clock that night. He dared not miss it. Guardsman Collett arrived at Waterloo Station at 9.30 p.m., along with about 60 other young men recruited that day. Each of them thought he had been singled out for special consideration by a recruiting sergeant. They were all very poor boys and were surprised to see each other. None of them knew that the army was obliged to recruit 12,000 men each year to make up the numbers, mostly lost through death. Also at Waterloo Station were around a hundred girls, dressed to kill. Oh, the skirts, the ribbons, the laces, the tucks, the frills and the flounces. Oh, the boots with dainty buttons and the wide-brimmed hats, heavy with fruit and flowers and feathers. And what was that, Joe saw? Could it be paint? Joe had never seen rouged lips and cheeks before, and he was enchanted. The girls clung to the soldiers, two or three to each. Some carried a file of gin or rum in their garters, and these were brought out with much skirt rustling and mock modesty. There was only half an hour before the train was due to leave, but the girls knew how to use the time to advantage. Much can happen in half an hour, and each girl knew that the recruits had been paid a shilling that day. Most of the recruits had gone alone to the station, but some were accompanied by mothers, aunts or sisters. These young men were put to great embarrassment by the girls who cast bold, contemptuous eyes on their womenfolk. These good women were scandalised by the wanton behaviour of the girls and tried to protect and warn their sons, which only made matters worse. Joe, being alone, taller than average and undoubtedly good-looking, was mobbed. He was offered a file of rum, which, laughing, he swallowed in one gulp. It went straight to his head. He clung to a brunette who cuddled him and led him round the station, singing. Joe felt he had never been so happy in his life. Two more girls joined them and led him out of the station, into the little lanes. It was a quarter to ten. In the lanes, the girls cuddled and kissed him and fondled him all over. In his intoxicated state, Joe felt that more than his blood was rising. It was then that the girls discovered Joe did not have his shilling on him. They screamed with rage. They kicked him and pushed him, and he fell against a wall, hitting his head. They tore his jacket off, frantically going through the pockets, threw it to the ground, Joe's beautiful red tunic, and trampled it in the mud. He cried out but could not stop them. They pulled his hair and scratched his face until the blood ran. They spat on him and then rushed off with a flick of skirts around the corner. Dazed, bewildered and bleeding, Joe tried to gather his senses. He couldn't think. His head hurt. He was sliding comfortably down the wall when a sharp noise penetrated his fuddled hearing. What was it? It was repeated. Dear heaven, it was the train whistle. Aldershot, the last train, must catch it. Desertion, flogging, prison. He snatched up his jacket, nearly falling flat on his face as he did so, staggered towards the station, hurtled towards the moving train, was pushed onto it by a porter, and fell into a seat. Oh, blimey, mate, you look as if you've had a good time said his companion with a sardonic grin. I roared with laughter at this story. We both laughed, Mr. Collett and I. Nothing binds people more strongly than the same sense of humour. I was thoroughly enjoying my evenings of sherry and an old soldier's reminiscences. In the firelight with a good storyteller like my companion, the years came alive. He was a dear old man, and reminded me of my own grandfather, whom I had loved and admired deeply, and who had been more of a father to me than my own father. He had died a couple of years previously at the age of eighty-four, and I still felt the loss. Incidentally, I never saw the bugs again, and after a while I ceased to look for them. 
At Aldershot, there were only four Scots Guards recruits the day Joe Collett arrived. It's a crack regiment, he said this with great pride. We were taken in marching order to the quartermaster's stores, where we were issued with topcoat, cape, leggings, one suit of scarlet and one of blue for drills, boots, shirts, socks and numerous pieces of regimental dress. We were issued with a rifle, bayonet and two white buff straps with pouches that could hold fifty rounds apiece. We were also issued with a busby, the tall fur headdress reserved for guards. Everyone in the regiment was very proud of these. We, the four of us that is, were shown to a whitewashed barrack room overlooking the square. A corporal was in charge of each billet, and a couple of older duty men also kept billet there. They showed us how to fix straps for drill purposes, how to roll the top coat and fix it to the kit bag, how to fix leggings, what cleaning materials we would need, how to place our cape and scarlet top coat when not in use on the rack above our cots, even how the straps of the kit bag should hang from the pegs above the head of the cot. The pettiness of it all, the meticulous attention to detail, reminded me of my nurse's training. I told Mr. Collett about it. We were issued with three fitted dresses, twelve aprons, five caps and a cape. We were given precise instructions on how they must be worn at all times. The hem of our dresses had to be fifteen inches from the floor, no more, no less. Caps, which were flat pieces of starched linen, had to be folded and pinned to an exact shape and size. Aprons had to be pinned at an exact point above the bosom and adjusted to the precise length of the dress. Shoes had to be black lace-ups of a specific style with rubber soles for quietness. Stockings were black with seams. Belts and epaulettes were of differing colours, distinguishing the different years of training a nurse underwent. Full uniform had to be worn at all times when on duty. I recall in my first year of training being ordered out of the dining room by a third-year nurse because I had forgotten to put on my cap. Later, when I became a ward sister, I forgot my cuffs on one occasion when I went to the matron's office and was sent back to the ward to get them before I could address her. We discussed whether this sort of discipline was necessary. Mr. Collett said, Well, it certainly is for men, because large numbers of men living together can easily become like wild animals. The discipline of the armed forces is the only thing that keeps them under control. I wouldn't have thought it was necessary for women, though, would you? But I maintain that nurses always look lovely, so I approve of the uniform. I chuckled at this. There is no doubt in my mind that the nurse's uniform of the early and middle 1900s was just about the sexiest thing ever invented. Nothing has surpassed it for allure. I was not the only young nurse to be acutely conscious of a heightened sex appeal when in uniform. Ironically, the draconian old sisters and matrons who rigidly enforced the uniform seemed to be unaware of the effect it had on the male sex. Those were the repressive days when student nurses had to live in barrack-like nurses' homes and be in by 10pm. No men were allowed and a nurse who smuggled one in would be dismissed if she was caught. Student nurses could not marry. All this was to repress our sexuality, and yet we were dressed up like sex kittens. With exquisite irony, in today's permissive society, when anything goes and nurses can do whatever they like sexually, the uniform has changed beyond all recognition, and the average nurse now looks like a sack of potatoes tied in the middle often wearing trousers rather than sexy black stockings. End of Disc 3 Shadows of the Workhouse, Disc 4 I asked Mr. Collett how he coped with all the regulation of army life. Was he as bad as I had been in my early nurses' training? I must have driven the ward sisters mad. He laughed and said he didn't believe it. But I had a hard time at first. We all did. 
The Scots Guards prided themselves on being a crack regiment. So we had more hours of drill, rifle and bayonet training, longer marches and heavier pack weights than other regiments. Also, we had less time off. We were so exhausted in the evening that I often made up my cot at 8pm and went fast asleep until Rivalli. I had more money than I'd ever had. On a shilling a day, I was able to send four shillings a week home to my mother. I knew that would pay the rent, and I swore to myself that I would always pay the rent, so she need never again fear the workhouse. And I kept that up, even when I was married. I asked him about his marriage. Well, after three months at Aldershot... I was given 48 hours leave to go to see my family before being posted to Plymouth. Across the court of Alberta buildings lived a girl I'd known for years, but she seemed so much more grown up than I'd remembered her, and I reckon she must have thought the same about me. She was the prettiest little thing I'd ever seen. He chuckled fondly and slowly refilled his pipe. We were only sixteen apiece, and forty-eight hours isn't long, but I knew she was the only girl in the world for me. We reached an understanding that she would wait for me until I was in a position to marry her. Long engagements were common in those days, and couples thought nothing of waiting ten or fifteen years before they could get married. As it happened, we had to wait only three years. After Plymouth, I was posted to Windsor Castle as one of Queen Victoria's foot guards. Oh, it was the best posting I had, and I loved it. It was at Windsor Castle I started reading. I knew I was not properly educated, but there was a library in the barracks, and reading became a passion with me. The more I read, the more I realised how ignorant I was. I spent all my spare time reading, and it was a habit that never left me, well, until my eyes began to go, and it became impossible. He looked sad, but perked up. But I can listen to the wireless. There's nothing wrong with my hearing. Anyway, with one thing and another, I loved it at Windsor Castle. Now, it's a funny thing, but in the army, I've noticed the less work you have to do, the more you get paid. We were paid ninepence extra per day for royal duties, good money, and I was able to apply for permission to marry. The colonel said we would have to wait until married quarters became available, and within two years Sally and I were married at All Saints Church, Poplar, just over the way there. I took her down to Windsor soon after. Our twins were born at Windsor Castle and I was the proudest young father in the regiment. But our happiness was too good to last. Infantrymen were being sent out to South Africa every week, and I had a feeling my turn would come, and it did. On the 1st of November, 1899, I sailed for South Africa. Mr. Collett's legs were greatly improved with daily treatment. The ulcers were reduced from about eight inches in diameter to two inches and were drying out. Consequently, the smell in the room was improving. The sickly sweet stench had definitely gone. I realized that the smell must have been due to the separation of the wounds. I reduced the visits to alternate days and then every third day, and the improvement was maintained. Our sherry evenings continued as a regular feature. He made no pretense about his joy at seeing me, and I began to think that I was the only person who visited him. It was unusual, if not unknown, to see a poplar man without family or friends. Family life was close and old people were valued. Neighbours lived on top of each other and were always in and out of each other's doors, especially in the tenements. Yet I never heard of anyone popping in on Mr. Collett to pass the time of day. I wondered why. He said, regarding his neighbours, I'm not one of them, you know. I was not born and bred in Alberta buildings, so they will never accept me. I asked him about his family. He said sadly, 
I've outlived them all. It's God's will that I should be left. One day we will be reunited. He wouldn't say any more. I hoped that as time went on he might. And so I asked him to tell me more about the Boer War. I was drafted in the autumn of 1899. Oh, my poor Sally was heartbroken. We were so happy at Windsor. She did washing and mending for the officers and earned some money that way. She was happy and as pretty as a picture. What's that jingle now? Let me think. The colonel's wife looks like a horse. The captain's wife is not much worse. The sergeant's wife looks a bit slicker, but the private knows how to pick her. Or something like that. Anyway, my Sal was the prettiest girl in the regiment. Our twins were born, and they were on their feet and running around when the postings came. We knew it would be for a long time. Sally and the boys couldn't stay at Windsor, so they went back to live with her mother. The flat is just above where we're sitting now. That's why I like living here. I can sit of an evening and think of Sally and the twins, when she was so young, living right above me. We sailed from Plymouth. There were crowds on the quayside cheering, but my heart was heavy. I reckon that single men make the best soldiers because they have few regrets about what they leave behind. He went on to describe the troop ship, crowded with men and horses, carts and wagons, guns and munitions, food and supplies. The journey took five weeks, but the men were in good spirits because it all seemed like an adventure. We were going to knock the hell out of those Boer farmers who dared to defy the British Empire, he said. They landed at Durban and were ordered to form ranks and march. They weren't told where they were going, but they marched for eight days in full winter uniform in the boiling heat, carrying 150-pound packs. The sun burned down relentlessly and flies and mosquitoes followed them all the way. There were no roads, so they marched through open scrubland and along rough tracks. The countryside was beautiful and wild, but they were too tired and hot to take it in. I'll tell you something about the Scots Guards. There is nothing in the world like the sound of the bagpipes to raise a man's morale, to lift his spirits and give him strength. However tired and thirsty we were, the bagpipes at the front of the column only had to strike up, and within seconds you felt your step lighten, your spirits rise, and every man Jack was marching along in rhythm to the pipes. Mr. Collett chuckled, straightened his shoulders, threw back his head, and swung his arms as though he were marching. There's a photograph of my regiment hanging on the wall over there. I peered at the grey and yellow photo of a column of soldiers, which didn't really mean a lot to me, but I said it looked impressive. Oh, yes, it was impressive, you're right. But at the same time, it was insane. I was surprised to hear that. Well, you imagine, going to war and marching through open country, soldiers in scarlet playing bagpipes, talk about secrecy or surprise tactics. The enemy could see us and hear us for God knows how many miles around, and we never saw them. All over South Africa, columns like ours were marching and being attacked by an unseen enemy, and yet the British generals still didn't learn. We carried on in our old swaggering ways and lost countless thousands of young men because of it. He told me they were ordered to climb a hill one night. He didn't know where because they weren't told, but it was steep and treacherous, more mountain than a hill. They had no special climbing equipment and wore their military uniforms with full pack. By dawn they had got to what they thought was the top, only to find that there were higher ridges all around that were invisible from below and in which groups of armed men were hiding. When the whole brigade had gained the first ridge, cannon and rifle fire opened up from all sides. They were completely unprepared. Hundreds of men were mown down before they could retaliate. Oh, I'll never forget the scene, said Mr. Collett. 
The cries and screams were terrible to hear. We formed ranks and fired back, but our position was hopeless. We were in full view of an enemy we could not see. It was a day of gunfire under a baking sun. No shelter, no water, just relentless gunfire. By nightfall, the barrage died away, and in the darkness all that could be heard were the groans of the wounded. We tried to help them, but there were no doctors or medical orderlies, no bandages or morphine, no stretchers, nothing. The men were ordered to leave their dead and retreat. In the sun, the injured would die of thirst the following day. That was the moment when I realised the truth of my mother's words, that we were just cannon fodder. Young private soldiers were ordered time and time again to march directly into gunfire, and High Command didn't give a damn how many died, nor the cost in human suffering. Mr. Collett was trembling, and his voice was shaky. He bit his lip to control himself. We didn't know it. The ordinary soldier didn't. But there had been no reconnaissance. There were no maps of the terrain, and no scouts had been sent ahead to assess the area or the heights of the various hills. If we'd had a ground map, the whole incident would never have happened. The British lost 2,000 men that day, and the Boers 200, all because there was no reconnaissance. I've read a lot of history in my life, and bad leadership crops up time after time in the British Army. Mr. Collett spoke with bitterness. They did not think of us as human beings. We were the scum of the earth, utterly disposable. I don't know how it was that I wasn't killed. In my regiment, more than three quarters of the men who went out to South Africa died, either in battle or in the military hospitals. Yet somehow I was spared. Another killer was disease. Mr. Collett had suffered slight leg wounds in one skirmish and had a short stay in hospital. While he was there, he saw a constant stream of men being brought in with what was called dysentery. It was, in fact, typhoid fever due to infected water and it spread like wildfire. I don't know if anyone who caught the disease recovered, but I know that I never saw a man walk out. I only saw the bodies carried out, ten or twenty a day from one ward, and they were quickly replaced by as many new patients. The small hospital that I was in had been built for three hundred patients, and it was carrying two thousand. There were nowhere near enough doctors or nurses to treat all those men, so most of them died. Three times as many men died in the hospitals as died on the battlefields. I didn't catch typhoid. I was spared for something worse. I wondered what could be worse. Somehow I survived and had to take part in what was called the bitter end. After two and a half years of fighting, we were no closer to victory than we had been at the beginning. We couldn't engage the enemy. They were always hiding and attacking our communications, our stores, always surprising us. So our generals decided to attack their food supplies. This meant attacking their farms. A scorched earth policy was approved and we private soldiers had to carry it out. We hated it. Most of us felt degraded and emasculated, attacking women and children. We turned them out of their homes and burned their farms and barns. We killed their animals and burned their fields. Nothing was left after we'd finished. They were turned out to wander the veldt with no water, no food, prey to wild animals. I remember one young Boer woman with two little children and a baby. She was sobbing, begging us to spare her. I wanted to, but refusal to obey military orders is unthinkable. It would have meant execution by firing squad. And even if I had disobeyed orders, it would have done no good. Other men would have carried out the job. He looked very grim and bitter. It was humiliating to us and to our commanding officers. 
We were sent out to fight men, not defenceless women and children. We should never have done it, never. Mr. Collett clenched his hands tightly. Now oh, it was a black time for the British Empire. Thirty thousand women and children died, mostly young children, and we were disgraced in the eyes of the world. We outnumbered the Boer fighting men by twenty-five to one. Yet even then we couldn't win without attacking their homes, their women folk, and their children. In the spring of 1903 I sailed for home, and I was discharged from the army in 1906. With my army record I was able to get a good job as a postman, and a postman I remained for the rest of my life until I retired with a pension to keep me comfortably in my old age. His ingenuous simplicity had always charmed me. He looked upon his squalid, bug-ridden flat as comfort, even luxury. He was grateful for a modest pension that enabled him to buy food and coal sufficient for his needs. He saw himself as a wealthy man who could afford to buy a bottle of sherry with which to entertain a young nurse of whom he had grown fond. He was completely content. I leaned forward and squeezed his hand with affection. My next visit to Mr. Collett was a morning about three days later. His legs had improved beyond all recognition and the ulcers were now completely dry. On the mantelpiece, amid all the dingy and faded old photographs, was a gleaming white card with a gold border and an embossed crown on it, requesting the pleasure of the company of Mr. Joseph Collett and Lady at the Old Gods reunion at Caterham Barracks, on a Saturday in June. He told me that he had enjoyed going to the Old Guards Day, but had not been able to go in recent years due to his deteriorating eyesight and bad legs. Impulsively, I said, Look, your legs are so much better now. It won't be any trouble for you to get around. Let's go together. It looks like good fun. It's not every girl has an opportunity like this, and I don't want to miss it. He positively lit up. He took my hands and kissed them. You darling girl, what a wonderful idea. It hadn't even crossed my mind. We'll go and make a day of it. I can tell you the gods do us old soldiers proud. What a day we'll have. What a day. I requested the day off well in advance, telling Sister Julienne about the invitation and the plans. The girls were most intrigued. Trixie suggested that a young guard's reunion might be more exciting, but wished me pleasure with my old ones. The day itself dawned bright and fair. I was round at Alberta Building shortly after eight o'clock. Mr. Collett was excited and chatty. He was dressed for the occasion in a faded old suit. His shoes had been polished and he carried a new Trilby hat. Most important of all, and by far the most impressive, he was wearing a row of medals on his chest. He was proud and happy, telling me what each one of them was for. We took the bus from Blackwall to Victoria Coach Station and then a coach to Caterham, arriving at about ten o'clock. I was excited, having never been inside a barracks before. For a young, inexperienced girl, it was a stupendous occasion, and my excitement communicated itself to Mr. Collett. We stayed very close together because of the crowds, and I held his arm all the time, as he couldn't see clearly. I had expected a rather solemn occasion, with a lot of old men talking about old times, but it was nothing like that. It was an open day with full military honours and pageantry. The reunion itself was an evening event. The day was exhilarating. The British Army really knows how to put on a show. The colour, the flags, the pipes and drums, the drills, the scarlet uniforms, black busbies, the marching with the pipe major throwing his staff high into the air. I was thrilled. Mr Collett heard my cheers and was delighted. Towards the evening, when the tired crowds were starting to leave, Mr. Collett pulled my arm. Now it's time for the regimental dinner. 
Come on, my beauty. They'll see the privates know how to pick them. We went to the great dining room by special invitation. We passed young soldiers who clicked their heels and saluted. We entered. The doorman took our card and called, Mr. Joseph Collett and Miss Jenny Lee. There were about two hundred men and women seated at the tables. Heads looked up, and then a voice called out, Gentlemen, now here is a really old guardsman. And everyone in the room stood up and raised their glasses. To an esteemed old soldier. Tears of emotion sprang from Mr. Collett's eyes. We were led to the colonel's table and placed at his side. The dinner was sumptuous and the colonel and his lady so gracious to the old man. They talked about the Boer War and Africa and army life sixty years earlier. He was treated with the respect and recognition that he deserved so well. One day, whilst treating his legs, I asked Mr. Collett about his life after leaving the army. I knew Sally and the twins were living in Alberta buildings by that stage. Did they continue to live there when he came back? No, I got a job in the post office, you see, and so we had to move near to the sorting office in Mile End. He went on to tell me about his new life. Postmen had to sort their own mail in those days, and had to be in the sorting house by four o'clock each morning to receive the night mail. Sorting took a couple of hours, and then they would be out on the road delivering until about 1pm. After a couple of hours they went back to sort and deliver the evening mail, which finished about 7pm. Mr Collett thought it was a good life. The twins were getting bigger, Pete and Jack were about six or seven, and the spitting image of each other. No one except their mother could tell them apart, and even she got it wrong sometimes. Oh, they were lovely boys. He bit his lip and swallowed hard, choking down the emotion. You've heard, I suppose, that identical twins often seem to live for each other. Well, I can tell you how true that is. They were two people, but I often thought that neither of them could be quite sure where one ended and the other began. They were always together. You couldn't separate them. They didn't seem to need anyone else. They had each other. Didn't their mother feel left out? Oh, you're right there, she did. The boys weren't lacking in affection or anything like that. They were just totally self-sufficient. In fact, Sally once said... I reckon you and me could die, Joe, and they wouldn't notice. But if one of the boys died, I reckon the other would just fade away. Tears glistened in the corner of his eyes, and he murmured, Perhaps it was for the best, or for the best. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. He fell completely silent, lost in thought. I had heard from Sister Julienne that Mr. Collett's two sons had died in the First World War. Now he sighed a sigh so deep that all the sorrow of the world seemed gathered into it. When he spoke, his voice was dull. We don't know what happened to them. A telegram, missing, presumed dead, was the message from the war office. Their bodies were never found. You see, men were just blown to pieces and nothing identifiable could be found. They lived through three and a half years in the trenches, only to go missing during the last months of the war. My Sally's heart was broken. Little Shirley was the only thing that kept us going. I saw more of Mr Collett after that, but we never again talked about the twins. He told me that with Shirley, Sally had nearly died in childbirth. I don't know what went wrong, and the midwife didn't either, but my Sal was near to death for weeks. Her sister took the baby and wet-nursed her for the first three months, and the boys went to my mother. God, it frightened the life out of me, so I never let her go through it again. That's one thing you learn about in the army, if nothing else, contraception. But Sally recovered, thank God, 
and the children came home. Shirley was the loveliest little thing in all the world and a blessing to us both. Shirley was the pride of his heart. She had had a good education and passed the school certificate, an achievement attained by very few East End girls in those days. This enabled her to go into the post office to be trained in accountancy and bookkeeping, to work as one of the counter staff. She also studied telegraphy and Morse code. It was two years of study, Mr. Collett said, and Shirley became a real expert. Her skills were greatly valued when the Second World War came. In 1939, she was put straight onto the reserve special occupation list. I had been a child during the war and, being country-born, had seen very little of the war itself. We lived only thirty miles from London, but life was peaceful and untroubled. My mother took in evacuees, which was good fun as far as I was concerned. Food was scarce and I didn't see a banana or an orange until I was ten, but apart from that there might not have been a war going on at all. Where, I wondered, had Mr. Collett spent the war? His response was firm. London was his home and it was where he had remained throughout the war. Sally didn't want to leave London either. It was where she had been born and bred. They both felt there was really no other option. In 1940, Mr. Collett retired from the post office. Straight away, he joined the ARP, Air Raid Precautions, and Sally joined with him. In the early months of 1940, the duties mainly involved checking that people carried gas masks, that blackout regulations were being observed, that sandbags were filled, and that air raid shelters were suitably equipped. But in September 1940, the Blitz started and their work really began. For three long months, London was bombed every night, and there were sometimes daylight raids as well. Bombing was concentrated mainly on the Docklands, but this was also the area with the highest civilian population, and hundreds of thousands of Londoners died or lost their homes. If one looks at a map of London, the horseshoe loop in the Thames going round the Isle of Dogs is fairly obvious. From the air, it is a landmark, and the German bomber pilots could not fail to see it. Bombs only had to be dropped on that target, and they were sure to hit either the docks or the housing around them. Thousands of tons of high explosive fell in less than three months. Poplar, housing up to 50,000 people to the square mile, was indeed a sitting target. There were never enough air raid shelters for such large numbers of people. In other parts of London, people went into the underground stations, but Poplar had none. The government provided corrugated iron for people to build Anderson shelters in their gardens. But most Poplar people did not have a garden. Fortunately, many houses did have cellars where people slept. The crypts of churches provided shelter for hundreds of people, and whole communities lived day and night in the churches. More than one baby was born in All Saints' Crypt, as I learnt from the sisters. The overcrowding was terrible. Each person had just enough room to lie down, and no more. There was always the fear that plague or disease would sweep through the shelters. Water and sewage pipes were frequently hit, but somehow they were always repaired, at least enough to prevent the spread of disease. Gas and electricity supplies were often hit too, but they were always patched up as well. Mr. Collett said to me, Oh, looking back, it seems impossible, but everyone worked day and night with amazing good spirit. When you are living in such conditions, close to death, every day is a gift. You are happy every morning to see the dawn break and to know that you are still alive. Also, death was no stranger to us. Poplar people were used to suffering. Poverty, hunger, cold, disease and death have been with us for generations and we have just accepted them as normal. So, a few bombs couldn't break us. And we were used to overcrowding, so the shelters didn't seem too bad. The loss of a house or rooms was no worse than eviction, and most people didn't have much furniture to lose anyway. 
a family would just move in with neighbours who still had a roof over their heads. It was an extraordinary time. Suffering and anguish were all around us. But so too, in a strange way, was exhilaration. We were determined not to be beaten. Two fingers up to Hitler. That was the attitude. I remember one old woman we pulled out of the rubble. She wasn't hurt. She gripped my arm and said, That bugger Hitler, he's killed me old man, good riddance. He's killed me kids, more's the pity. He's bombed me house, so I got nowhere to live. But he ain't got me. And I got sixpence in me pocket, and that pub on the corner, Master's Arms, ain't been bombed. So let's go and have a drink and a sing-song. There was even more devastation when the firebombs came, and it was these that were responsible for Sally's death. The government appealed for volunteer fire watchers who would go to the top of tall buildings to keep a watch on the area around them. They gave the alert when a firebomb fell and the men rushed to the spot at once to put out the fire. Sally volunteered. She and others went up the highest buildings with nothing but a tin hat to protect them from explosives and firebombs. One night the building Sally was in got a direct hit. I never saw her again. Her body was never found. He paused and stared into the fire for a few minutes. Then he said softly, She knew the risk. We both did. I'm glad that she was taken first and not left on her own. Death is kinder than life. There is no more suffering beyond the grave. We will meet again soon, I hope. He said the words, soon, I hope, a second time, and I didn't know what to say. So I asked him about his daughter. Shirley's skills in Morse code and telegraphy were classed as a special occupation. She joined the WAF, Women's Auxiliary Air Force, in 1940, and entered the Intelligence and Communications Corps of the RAF. Her father saw a little of her when she came home on leave, but mostly he didn't even know where she was stationed because all her work was highly confidential and secrecy was tight. She had never married and had always been very close to her parents. After her mother's death, she threw herself into her work. Mr Collett, too, found that hard work was the only remedy for unhappiness. After Sally's death, he worked day and night. As an ARP warden, he did anything and everything that needed doing. Helping the ambulance men, digging away rubble, carrying water, filling sandbags, and mending burst pipes. He went out at night when bombs were dropping all around, not caring if he was killed. He helped people out of burning buildings, got them to shelters, carried babies, pushed prams. It was a hard time, but satisfying, he told me. And all the while, I fancied Sal was looking down on me and sharing the experience. During the next four years, I saw Shirley occasionally. She was flourishing. War has that effect sometimes. The unusual circumstances bring out the best in some people. All her intelligence and leadership qualities placed her in positions of command, and she thrived on it. Oh, I was so proud of her. In 1944, it seemed that the war was ending, and we dared to plan for her demob and picking up our life again. But it never does to plan ahead in wartime. The V-1 and V-2 rocket attacks started. At Christmas 1944, I was told by the RAF that a rocket had fallen on the staff headquarters where Shirley was stationed, and that she'd been killed. I've been alone ever since. Poplar was destined for change. Town planners had a new broom with which to sweep clean, and they were so successful that they swept virtually everything away. Poplar had survived the war, the blitz, the doodlebugs, and the V-2 rockets. The people had picked themselves up, 
brushed off the debris and formed themselves into a community again, almost indistinguishable from the communities of their parents and grandparents. What finally destroyed Poplar was the good intentions of bureaucracy and social planning. The tenements were to be demolished. In 1958 and 1959, notice was served to thousands of tenants, and alternative accommodation was offered. This could be as far away as Harlow, Bracknell, Basildon, Crawley, or Hemel Hempstead, which might as well have been the North Pole as far as most of the older people were concerned. Social workers and housing officers buzzed in and out of the tenements all day with sheaves of forms and good advice and forced good cheer. The residents were not taken in. Most were wary or apprehensive. Some were distraught. Mr Collett's neighbour came up to me one day as I entered the court of Alberta buildings and said piteously, They says we got to go. Go where? Somewhere we don't know, somewhere a long way off. Somewhere no one'll know me and I won't know no one. Oh, it ain't right, it ain't. I always paid me rent so you can look at me book. Never a day late. I keeps me flat clean like me mum used to. You can see for yourself. Can't you do something? The sisters have a lot of say in things round here. All the sisters experience scenes like this. The idea amongst the older generation that the sisters would somehow intervene and help them save their little homes was touchingly persistent, but quite erroneous, of course. We tried to comfort the people as best we could, but I doubt if it did much good. The community was doomed. The people who had seen off Hitler by sticking two fingers up and carrying on were themselves seen off the premises. Then the demolition men took over. The land became valuable. Big business stepped in. The ordinary people didn't stand a chance. Tower blocks were built, which were supposed to be so much better than the tenements. In fact, they were the same thing, only far worse, because interaction between neighbours had been stripped away. The courtyards had gone. The inward-facing balconies had gone. Walkways and stairways had gone and upstairs and downstairs neighbours were strangers with no obvious points of contact. The communal life of the tenements, with all its fraternity and friendship, all its enmity and fighting, was replaced by locked doors and heads turned away. It was a disaster in social planning. A community that had knitted itself together over centuries to form the vital, vibrant people known as the Cockneys was virtually destroyed within a generation. But this was all in the future. We did not know in 1959 that the effects would be so catastrophic to the popular people. We only knew what was happening at the time, namely that the Canada buildings were to go. Mr. Collett's legs were almost better now, and he was quite capable of dressing the superficial wounds himself. I called only once a fortnight to check that there was no deterioration. He was able to get about easily, which was entirely due to simple, regular treatment. Nursing is one of the most satisfying jobs in the world. He was thoughtful as I undid the bandages. Uh, you know that the buildings are being closed. I don't understand why. These buildings are sound. They were here after the Blitz when thousands of terraces went down like packs of cards. The Canada buildings will last for centuries, yet they want to pull them down. All my ghosts will be cleared away with the rubble. Will they be laid to rest, I wonder? Will I... His words sounded like a premonition. What are they offering you? I asked. He started as though I'd interrupted a dream. Offering me? Oh, well, I don't know. Several things. A, a flat in Harlow, another in somewhere called Hemel Hempstead. I must say it's very good of them to offer me anything at all. I'm grateful for that. And I told the lady social worker so. I smiled at his generous disposition. 
How long have you got to decide? I asked. Oh, a month, no longer. It's all very sudden. It was indeed sudden. The sound of children playing was the first thing to go. Flats were vacated and removal men were in and out of the courtyards. Windows were boarded up. The stairways were left dirty and increasingly derelict. Dustbins rolled across the cobbles. The constant hum of human activity was replaced by empty echoes as the courts picked up the sound of a single voice. I popped in on Mr. Collett about a week later to ask if he had come to a decision. He had. I'm going to St. Mark's in Mile End, he said. When I was young, it used to be a workhouse, but that was a long time ago. Now it is a residential home for old codgers like myself. I think it will be for the best. The lady social worker tells me I will be well looked after. I'm going next week. I was shocked and alarmed by the news. The shadow of the workhouse had darkened the lives of countless people for more than a century. Although officially closed in 1930 by Acts of Parliament, workhouses had merely lingered on under another name. I feared for Mr. Collett, but I did not like to sound negative, so I simply said, I'll come and see you, I promise. Back at Nanata's house, I poured out my misgivings to Sister Julienne. She was thoughtful and looked grave, but said, You must understand that this is his decision. He is intelligent, and I think he probably realises that he will not be able to manage to look after himself, alone, in a new place. I was young and passionate and argued the case. But he's so much better now. He can get around without any trouble. Although his eyesight is dim, he's not blind, and he can find everything he needs. Sister Julienne smiled her sweet, beautiful smile. Yes, my dear, I know, but that is only because he knows where everything is, and habit makes it possible for him to continue living alone. In other surroundings he would be lost. It's the same for most old people. My unease persisted, but I knew there was nothing I could do. It was a fortnight later when I cycled up to Mile End to find St. Mark's. I entered by the huge iron gate and looked at the bleak grey buildings. I was accustomed to the old workhouse buildings because most of them had been converted into hospitals or isolation units. I knew that they all had a particularly grim appearance, but I had never seen anything as forbidding as St. Mark's. My heart sank as I looked around. I inquired after Mr. Collett of the only person I saw, a rather dirty-looking porter pushing a trolley of bins. He spoke no English, but pointed to a door. Inside was a sort of office area with no one around. It was cold and high-ceilinged, with plaster crumbling off the walls. I called, and my voice echoed up the stairwell. Still, no one came. I wandered out and through another door. A wide, empty corridor stretched ahead with doors going off it. I opened one and entered a large, square room where a lot of old men were sitting around four mica-top tables. For a room so full of humanity, it was eerily quiet. Faces looked up at me, all blank and expressionless. I could not see Mr. Collett nor could I see anyone to ask about him. Some plates rattled which indicated a kitchen, and I went towards the sound. Two young men were inside, but neither of them spoke English. Back in the hall with the echoing stairwell, I hung around and helloed for about twenty minutes. Eventually, a middle-aged man entered, carrying a sheaf of papers. I gave him my request. He looked at me in astonishment. You want to see Mr. Collett? Yes. Why? Are you a social worker? No, I just want to see him. I, have I come at the wrong time, then? Am I out of visiting hours? No, we don't have any visiting hours. 
We generally don't get any visitors. I'll have to open the office and find out where this Mr. Collett is. In the office, he thumbed through piles of papers. Mr. Joseph Collett, is that the name you want? Block E, fifth floor. Go up that staircase you see opposite. I climbed five flights and pushed open the heavy door, entering a room similar to the one I had seen on the ground floor. It was large, with about twenty-four mica-top tables and four hard-back chairs at each table. Old men were sitting on most of the chairs, their arms on the table, staring at the man opposite. Some had their heads down, resting on their arms. No one spoke. The room smelled acrid with urine and body odour. The high windows let in light, but they were too high for anyone to see out. I looked around until I saw Mr. Collett at the far end of the room. He was looking down at the table at which he was sitting and did not see me approach. I went straight up to him and kissed him. He gasped, looked up, and tears filled his eyes. His lips trembled, and he whispered, Oh, my maiden, my Jenny, you've come then. He was too overwhelmed to say anything more. The chair opposite was empty, so I sat down and we held hands across the table. I would have come sooner, only I thought you should have a chance to settle in and get to know your companions. I'm so sorry if you thought I wasn't coming. Oh, that's all right, my pet, that's all right. You're here, and I love you for it. I'm so grateful. He squeezed my hand. I bit my lip, close to tears myself, and looked round at the cheerless room filled with lethargic old men saying nothing. I didn't know what to say myself. We had never had any difficulty with conversation before. In fact, time had always seemed too short for all that we had to say. But now I was tongue-tied. I asked empty questions like... Well, are you all right, then? What's the food like? Are you comfortably here? To all of which he replied bleakly, Yes, I'm doing very nicely, thank you. You don't want to worry your head about me. Minutes ticked by, and there were long silences. I knew I would have to go, because I had my evening visits to start at 4 p.m., it had taken me at least forty-five minutes to find him, and time was short. I hated leaving him, as I tried haltingly to explain. He said simply, You go, my maid, and don't mind me. I kissed him again and fled from the room. At the door, I turned. He was stroking the cheek where my lips had touched him, and his tears were falling fast onto the table. I don't know how it was I didn't have an accident as I cycled back to Nanata's house. I was filled with sorrow. After supper, I spoke to Sister Julienne. She listened in silence and didn't speak for a long time. Thinking she hadn't taken it in, I said, You do understand what I'm saying, don't you? It's simply dreadful. He shouldn't be there. Oh, yes, my dear, I understand all right. I was thinking of our Lord's words to Peter, as recorded in St. John's Gospel. When you are young, you go where you wish, but when you are old, others will take you where you do not wish to go. This was taken to indicate the manner in which St. Peter would die. But I have always thought that it is a general reflection about us all we all grow old, and very few of us retain our health and strength to the last. Most of us become helpless and dependent on others, whether we like it or not. Old age is a time when we learn the virtue of humility. I did not know what to say. I had often found myself in a similar position with Sister Julienne. She had a purity of thought and a simplicity of expression that were quite unanswerable. She continued, Mr. Collett's tragedy is that all his family were killed in the wars. 
The tragedy is loneliness, not the surroundings, which I doubt he notices. What you see as intolerable living conditions may be all par for the course to him. If he were living in luxury in a palace, he would be just as lonely. You are his only friend, Jenny, and he loves you. You must stay with him. I said that I had pledged myself to do that, and then I started to rail against the folly and inhumanity of turning him out of the flat where he had been comfortable and independent. She stopped me in mid-sentence. Yes, I know all that, but you must understand that the Canada buildings have long been due for demolition. People are not going to put up with bug-infested environment and insanitary conditions today. The buildings must go, so the people must go. I'm well aware of the fact that most of the old people who are being moved will not be able to adjust to new surroundings, and that many of them will die as a consequence. Which brings me back to the words of Jesus. When you are old, men will take you where you do not want to go. She smiled at me, because I must have looked so sad, and said, Now I must go and take Compline. Why not join us this evening? The beauty and timelessness of the monastic office of Compline eased my troubled soul. The Lord grant us a quiet night and a perfect end. I thought of Mr. Collett and all the other old men, isolated even from each other by loneliness. In thee, O Lord, have I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. The candles lighting the altar were reflected on the windows, shutting the dark without and enclosing the nuns within. Be thou my strong rock and house of defence. Jews and Christians have drawn strength and wisdom from these psalms for two to three thousand years. Thou shalt not be afraid of any terror by night, for he shall give his angels charge over thee. Did they know any joy in their joyless surroundings? Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord. Just hold them in your prayers, as Sister Julienne will in hers. Protect us through the silent hours of the night, so that we who are wearied by the changes and chances of this fleeting world may repose upon thy eternal changelessness. The sisters left the chapel quietly. The greater silence had begun. I saw Mr. Collett as much as I could after that. I never stayed very long, mainly because we both found it difficult to know what to say. The circumstances were just not right for cosy chats, and we were no good at small talk. Also, the inertia, I think, was dulling the mind that had once been so alert, Knowing how much he used to enjoy radio documentary programs and plays, I asked him if he listened to his wireless. He looked at me blankly, so I repeated the question. No, I haven't got my wireless. I don't know what they did with it. I don't think I could have it here anyway, so it doesn't matter. The big room with its high windows was oppressive, and the all-pervading smell of urine nauseating. But the worst thing for them, I could see, was the boredom of having absolutely nothing to do, hour after hour, day after day. A few played cards or dominoes, but the games never seemed to excite much interest. The Daily Mirror and Express were passed around, and some of the men glanced at them, but from what I observed, most of them just sat at the tables looking at each other. I never saw any other visitor, and I wondered how it was possible that so many old men could have no one at all who wanted to visit them. I saw only Block E, fifth floor, and I did not know how many other blocks and floors there were, filled with old men seemingly abandoned, each day killing the time, until time killed them. One day I asked Mr. Collett where his pipe was and if he smoked it. He said, 
we are only allowed to smoke on the balcony. Well, do you do so then? No, I don't know where the balcony is. I felt very cross at such thoughtlessness on the part of the staff. They were not unkind, as far as I could see, but they were mostly Filipino or Indonesian young men who spoke little or no English, and it obviously had not occurred to any of them to take a nearly blind man to the balcony and make sure that he knew how to find his way there and back. Well, let's go out to the balcony then, and you can have a smoke, and we can get some fresh air at the same time. Have you got your pipe, your twist, and some matches? Uh, not on me, they're in my locker. I'll go and get them. You can come with me. I don't suppose anyone would mind. He stood up and felt his way along the tables to a short corridor at the end of which was a wide double door leading into a dormitory. It was the size of the average hospital ward, designed for 28 or 30 beds. It held, at a rough guess, 60 or 70. They lined each wall, and the far end wall also. They were small, two-foot, six-inch iron bedsteads, with thin mattresses over sagging springs. Beside each was a tiny locker, about twelve inches wide, and the beds touched the lockers on either side. At the far end of the dormitory there were no lockers, and the beds were so close to each other that, presumably, the only way the occupant could get in and out was by climbing over the end. Some were occupied by old men who just lay there, sleeping, or staring at the ceiling. My critical nurse's eye looked at the bed linen and blankets. All were filthy, and the stench of urine and feces was evidence that fresh linen was a rarity. A ward sister would have had a team of cleaners in there in seconds, but I saw no staff at all that day. Mr. Collett felt his way along fourteen beds, and then went to the locker beside the fifteenth. I noticed that he was walking with difficulty again. I thought with alarm about his leg ulcers, so much better, but only because of regular treatment. Was he still getting it? I looked around at the general neglect and had misgivings. He found his pipe, and we made our way first to the table where he had been sitting, and then to the balcony, counting the number of tables and the direction he would have to take. I wanted to be sure he knew how to get there by himself. The fresh air was lovely, though cold, and the balcony was pleasant, but there was nowhere to sit down. Mr. Collett filled his pipe and lit it, and with a satisfied sigh exhaled clouds of thick smoke. Oh, luxury, he murmured, sheer luxury. I noticed the way he was standing. It was not good. He was shuffling from one leg to the other and taking a few steps backwards and forwards. I didn't like the signs. People with leg ulcers can usually walk, but standing still in one place is nearly impossible for them. I asked him how his legs were and who was treating them. Well, I can do it myself. Yes, but do you? Oh, now and again, less now and again. How often? Every day? Well, not quite every day, but enough, quite enough. Do the staff renew the dressings? They looked at them when I first came here, but I don't recall since. I was silent. Two months. No trained person dressing the ulcers or supervising his treatment. It was not good enough. I would like to have a look at them. Oh, another time, another time. I'm enjoying the fresh air and the pipe and above all your company. I know you'll have to go soon and I don't want to spoil it. You can look at my legs another day. He was right. The time was drawing near to 4pm and my evening visits. I could not linger, so I kissed him tenderly and left him with his pipe and a rare smile on his face. The next occasion when I called, Mr. Collett was not at his usual table. The man who generally sat opposite him pointed to the dormitory and said, 
He ain't got up today. I went to the dormitory, and in the fifteenth bed on the right, Mr. Collett lay motionless. I looked at him for a long time from the doorway, hating myself for hating the smell and for not wanting to approach the bed. A sort of dread had entered my heart, and I wanted to turn and run. He moved and coughed slightly, and this set me in action. I went up to his bed, kissed him, and whispered, It's me. Are you all right? It's not like you to stop in bed. He took my hands and kissed them, and murmured that he, he would be all right by and by. I sat beside him, not talking, squeezing his hand from time to time, thinking. It occurred to me that whilst he was lying in bed, it would be easy to look at his legs, so I asked him if I could. He seemed indifferent. I pulled the blankets away from the foot of the bed, and the stench of decaying flesh rose to greet me. A rough, fluid-sodden bandage covered each leg, and I unwound them with difficulty. I had no surgical forceps or scissors and had to do it with my fingers. The bandages looked as though they had not been changed for a fortnight and were stuck to the flesh underneath. As I tried to ease them away, I thought I might be hurting him, but he did not move nor show any sign of pain. At last the wounds were fully exposed, I had to grip the iron bedstead and call upon all my nurse's training of discipline and self-control to avoid crying out. From the knee to the ankle, there was no skin at all, just livid, suppurating flesh oozing pus and blood. Daylight was fading fast, and the dim electric light bulb hanging from the ceiling was no great help, but I thought I could see traces of black around the edge of the wound. I looked down at his feet. The toes looked greyish and swollen. One or two of them a darker colour than the others. Oh, my God, it can't be. Oh, please, no, not him. It's not fair. There was only one way to tell. I unfastened the brooch I was wearing and dug the pin deep into the centre of the wound on each leg. He didn't move. Then I dug it really hard into his toes. He didn't feel a thing. There could not be the slightest doubt. Gangrene. He said, Oh, they're feeling better today. They've been giving me jip the last few weeks, but they don't hurt now. And I guess they're getting better. I had to control myself. Fortunately, he could not see my face, but he was sensitive to my voice. As long as you're comfortable, you just stay there. I'll go and get someone to put another dressing on, because I've taken the bandages off. I won't be long. I raised the alarm, and later the superintendent and a doctor came to the dormitory. But in the meantime, I had to leave for my evening work. After I had finished my visits, I cycled back to St. Mark's and for the last time climbed the staircase to the fifth floor of Block E. Mr. Collett had been transferred to Mile End Hospital. I was relieved to hear it and I cycled the half mile down the road to the hospital. It was too late to see him but I was told that he was comfortable and sleeping. Immediately after lunch the next day, I cycled up to the hospital and went straight to the ward. The ward sister told me that Mr. Collett had been operated on that morning and had not yet come round from the anaesthetic. The operation had been a mid-thigh amputation of both legs. I was taken to the side room where he lay. The calm, cleanliness and efficiency of the hospital was reassuring after the shambolic dirt of St. Mark's. Mr. Collett lay on spotless white sheets, his face calm and relaxed. A nasal tube was in situ, and a nurse was sucking the mucus from his throat with an aspirator. She then counted his pulse and checked the flow rate of the blood drip that was running into his arm. 
She smiled at me as she turned to go. Hospital protocol and discipline had the upper hand, and Mr. Collett was now a part of it. I sat with him for a little while, but he was fast asleep and looked quite peaceful, so I left, resolving to come back after my evening visits. It was about 7.30pm when I approached the ward, and the screams assailed me long before I pushed open the door. A harassed-looking staff nurse was on duty, and as I ran towards the side ward, a frightened nurse whispered, I think he's gone mad. Mr. Collett was sitting bolt upright in bed, his blind eyes staring wide with terror. He was waving his arms and screaming, Watch out! To your left, a grenade exploding! He screamed and ducked to escape an invisible missile flying over his head. I ran to him and took him in my arms. It's me, Jenny, me, I'm here. He grabbed me with superhuman strength and pushed me down to the floor. Get down, keep your head down, they'll blow you to bits. A bloke over there had his head blown off a minute ago. That one over there has lost both his legs. It's a terrible place to be. Gunfire all around. Down, get down! He screamed with all his strength and hurled himself forward. The stumps of his legs twitched violently and he fell out of bed. He seemed impervious to the fall and grabbed me, pulling me under the bed with him. Stay here. You'll be safe here in the shelter. I'll keep a lookout for any other poor soul. Look out! He screamed and looked up. That plane, see? It's just dropped its load of bombs. They're coming for us. It'll be a direct hit. He screamed louder than ever. Keep down! A doctor and two male orderlies rushed into the ward. The staff nurse had a syringe filled and ready. The orderlies crawled under the bed and held Mr. Collett, who was fighting and screaming. The doctor injected a powerful anaesthetic, and a few minutes later... Mr. Collett rolled over onto his side, asleep, but the stumps of his legs twitched violently with involuntary nervous spasms. We were all shaken and trembling. The two orderlies picked the old man up and put him back into bed. He looked peaceful again. The hospital staff left, but I sat by his bedside for a long time, crying quietly. At 9.30, the night sister asked me to leave, saying he would be kept sedated all night and telling me to ring in the morning. Before breakfast, I rang the hospital and was told that Mr. Collett had died peacefully at 3.30 a.m. There was no last post for the old soldier, no solemn drum roll, no final salute. No lowering of the colours. There was just a contract funeral arranged by the hospital. A priest and one mourner followed the coffin, and we travelled in the hearse next to the driver. We were driven to a cemetery somewhere in North London, I don't remember where. I only remember a cold, bleak November day as we stood on either side of the open grave the priest and I reciting the office for the burial of the dead. Dust to dust, ashes to ashes. The men shoveled the soil over the coffin, and I laid purple daisies on the rich brown earth. It was many years later, perhaps fifteen or twenty, when Mr. Collett visited me. I was happily married, my daughters growing up, my life in full flow. I had not thought of Mr. Collett for years. I woke in the middle of the night, and he was standing at the side of my bed. He was as real as my husband sleeping beside me. He was tall and upright, but looked younger than when I had known him, like a handsome man of about sixty or sixty-five. He was smiling, and then he said, you know the secret of life, my dear, because you know how to love. And then he disappeared. In 1930, the workhouses were closed by Act of Parliament, officially, that is. 
but in practice it was impossible to close them. They housed thousands of people who had nowhere else to live, and many of them had been in the workhouses for so long they were completely institutionalized and could not have adjusted to the outside world. Also, the 1930s was the decade of the economic depression with massive unemployment. Thousands of workhouse inmates, suddenly thrown onto the labour market, would only have made matters worse. So the workhouses were officially designated public assistance institutions, and in order to make them more acceptable, would be locally referred to by such names as Glebe House, Rose House, and so on. But in practice they carried on much the same as before. The label pauper was replaced by inmate and the uniform was scrapped. Comforts such as heating, a sitting room, easy chairs and better food were introduced. Inmates were allowed out. The inhumane practice of splitting families was stopped. But still, it was institutional life. The staff were the same, and the attitudes and mindset of the masters and officers were stuck firmly in the 19th century. Discipline remained strict, sometimes inflexible, depending on the character of the master. But punishments for transgression of the rules were relaxed, and life was certainly easier for the inmates of the institution than it had been for the paupers of the workhouse. The buildings continued in use for many decades for a variety of purposes. Some were used as mental hospitals right up until the 1980s, when they were finally closed by the Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. Many were used as old people's homes, and my description of Mr. Collett's last weeks in such a place in the late 1950s is by no means unique. I was giving a talk to the East London History Society about this book when it was first published, and a lady in the audience stood up and said, Your description is not exaggerated. In the 1980s, I was with a group of people taken round an old people's home which had formerly been a workhouse, and the conditions you describe were exactly the same. This was, as far as I remember, in 1985 or 1986. The infirmaries continued as general hospitals for many decades, but the stigma of the old association with the workhouses was never eradicated. During my nursing career, I saw many times the fear in a patient's eyes who thought they had been put in a workhouse, even though they were in a modern hospital. In 2005, I was giving a radio talk and I mentioned this. The interviewer said, I know exactly what you mean. Only a few years ago, in 1998, my granny was taken to the infirmary. She begged and pleaded not to go because she thought she was being put in the workhouse. She was terrified, and I swear it was that which killed her. The stigma lingered, and most of the old infirmaries in the country have now been demolished or converted into commercial or residential buildings. We who live comfortable, affluent lives in the 21st century cannot begin to imagine what it must have been like to be a pauper in a workhouse. We cannot imagine our children being taken away from us because we are too poor to feed them, nor our liberty being curtailed for the simple crime of being poor. There are very few records left to tell us what the lives of workhouse paupers were like. Every workhouse kept meticulous records, but these were official records written by administrators. The paupers themselves kept no records. Similarly, there are very few photographs of the paupers. Thousands of archive photographs of the buildings, the guardians, the masters, their wives and officers can be found in council records. But there are virtually none of the paupers themselves. The few that we do have are tragic to behold. There is a blank, hopeless look on all the faces, the same dull eyes, the same death-like despair. But before we condemn the workhouses as an example of 19th century exploitation and hypocrisy, we must remember that the mores of the time were completely different from the standards of today. For the working class, life was nasty, brutish and short. Hunger and hardship were expected. Men were old at 40, women worn out at 35. 
the death of children was taken for granted. Poverty was frankly regarded as a moral defect. Social Darwinism, the strong adapt and survive, the weaker crushed, was borrowed and distorted from The Origin of Species, 1858, and applied to human organisation. These were the standards of society, accepted by rich and poor alike, and the workhouses merely reflected this. Is there anything good that can be said about the old workhouse system? I think there is. Thousands of children who would have died of starvation on the streets were housed and reared, brutally perhaps by modern standards, but they survived. And after the 1870 Education Act, they were also educated. Mass illiteracy became history, and within a couple of generations the population of Great Britain could read and write. I recall one woman who was over 80 when I met her in the year 2000. She was an illegitimate child of a servant girl and her master. His wife discovered the girl's pregnancy and dismissed her. The girl went to the workhouse. That was in 1915. The old lady said to me, Oh, I'm grateful to the workhouse. I learned the value of discipline and good behaviour. I learned to read and write. No, I never knew my mother, but none of us did. When I was fourteen, I went into service. But I bettered myself and learned secretarial work in night classes and became a secretary. I am very proud of what I have achieved. I don't like to think what might have happened to me had it not been for the workhouse.